Hey, everybody, what's going on? Rob Sesternino back here with another entry into one of the most highly requested podcast series that we do here on Rob's podcast because it is an honor once again to welcome back a man who has the answers to so many of your questions that we are now on the fourth edition of Ask Dr. Hubicki. Here he is, my great friend. Dr. Christian Hubicki is here. Christian, how are you? Oh, I'm great, Rob, especially now I'm here with you to talk about questions people have. So it's great to be back. Thank you for having me. Christian, uh, always excited when we get the signal you're up for another uh, Ask Dr. Hubicki. Oh, I, 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 and I'm excited to do it too, because normally it's also a signal in my life that some incredibly stressful period is over and I'm looking to, to, to celebrate uh, by doing something else. So it's, mm -hmm. it, so it's good. So the, uh, I, a period of trap for me, it was a period of a lot of, uh, overdue travel for me for work. Oh. And I got to do a lot of travel for that. And it was jam packed, exciting and exhausting. And it's nice to get back and you know, talk about Reuben sandwiches for a bit. Yes. Where did you go? So I had a conference in Philadelphia, which I I met at least I think at least a few of your patrons actually mm -hmm. while I was there. Uh, it was it was during the Survivor finale for season forty two, and I was at this robotics conference, and one of the people at the expo happened to be a big Survivor fan. I ran into them, and they're like, "Oh, we're having a watch party at a bar," and so I just showed up, and we watched Marianne win together. Mm -hmm. And then I, I had a, a, a brief trip out to Palo Alto for another thing. Yeah, it was fun. It was a fun time. Got to hang out with some fans in the middle of the robotics conference. And uh, I had a few other robotics conferences after that in uh, in California and in Wisconsin, of all places. So now I'm back. Okay. We have solicited over 200 questions from the listeners of Rob as a podcast, uh, the uh, Instagram followers of Christian Hubicki. We are also live here for the Rob as a podcast patrons, and we may take some questions live. If you have good ones along the way, uh, you can submit those in the comments. Christian can see them. Uh, if there's anything that uh, you know uh, strikes his fancy, we'll go ahead and maybe we'll do some live here on the show uh, of course uh we'll be covering topics of course uh you know the big three which are science pop culture and survivor here on the ask dr hubicki episode number four yep and look forward to going wherever this wherever it takes us rob i think that sometimes our little diversions into random subjects will just i think last time we were talking about I forget what, and then it became the heat death of the universe is what we ended up on by yeah, the end of it. So yeah. you never know where it'll take us. The circuitous route to hopefully things that, you know, stick in people's minds and remember for later. So, And as we were prepping for this podcast, you know, uh, we were talking about just uh, some of the things that have come out of this podcast. Uh, Christian, I, I know that people have like messaged you that they have cited some of your answers in uh, papers and uh, different projects. Yeah, it was it was a really, I have to say, I was very thrilled by how people have responded to these podcasts. Thank you all who sent positive messages. It, it was a lot of fun to hear your responses, including I, I was shocked when I talked to, to one of your patrons, I believe, Rob, who said that they were working on a late night paper on some kind of scientific review of some sort, and they cited our podcast together to t talking about some robotics topic. And apparently the, the professor noted this and said, well, you know, this is probably one of the first times I've seen a podcast referenced in, in a, in a paper. So mm -hmm. what, what I figured I would do here, Rob, and, and, and people feel free to reference this podcast, of course, but what I'll do after the fact, if there's anything interesting that I want to have a primary reference to, I will link to it in Twitter and maybe I'll send it to your produce, producer. We can put it in the description or something. So that of the videos, that way people can go okay. uh, and find primary literature and that way they can cite the primary literature to these answers as well. Wow. Nobody's ever done that before. 
hey, we're breaking new ground on this podcast. We're breaking Rob. new ground. We're, we're yeah. breaking new ground. You know, we're, you know, it's the you know, new era the, of podcasting. Drop the four. Keep. I don't know how the this analogy is, goes no, this here. This is four. We can't drop the. This four. is four. Yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. Then we'd, be, then we'd be the zero at that point. That wouldn't work. But yeah. So it, so yeah. That that. So mm-hmm. I will try to jot down things that I talk about and this drop the decimal literature. points after the four because uh, we don't need them. Exactly. So we, you, know, I'll give you the Dewey decimal of where you can find the answer to these questions thereafter. Okay. Uh, anything else on your mind before we jump in? Well, so yeah, I mean, I, I should also point out that, like, you know, so people who have found my email online, it's not a secret. You go to my web, my website at christianubiki.com. You can find my professional email. I, I am pretty uh, bogged down with emails, but when I see a survivor one pop by, I, I try to send a response when I can. And so people, that's where people have been sending me their their papers. Actually, someone wrote a a game theory paper based upon our discussion of Shipwheel Island oh, that wow. we were talking about last time. It was a full game theory paper for their game theory class, and we went back and forth on a, a, about a few suggestions on the paper. And that was I, so. I got a shout out to Blake Silver from the University of Delaware who sent me that. Thank you, Blake. Mm-hmm. Okay. Let's start to take some questions from our listeners, and uh, let's. Why don't we start off with a big one, okay, Christian? All right, got it. Here we go. Lately, in pop culture, mm-hmm. there's a lot of talk about the multiverse in the zeitgeist. All forms of media that they are bringing in the multiverse. I mean, even you could say. Uh, Survivor 40 was like uh, the multiverse happening, okay? So do you believe in the multiverse? This is from an anonymous listener. Well, that's a great question. And yeah, it's in the news a lot recently because of the Doctor Strange movie that had come out a few months back and the multiverse of madness. The short answer is I don't believe in it yet, okay? And yet is an important part because it is a scientific concept that a lot of scientists take very seriously and many accept as true. Um, But the direct evidence of a multiverse is still, in my opinion, not to the point where I would say, yes, I believe it's true. Now, that doesn't mean I say, no, I believe it's not true. It's it's like any other sort of evidence-based claim. You have to have enough evidence to say you believe it. And until then, you can either believe it nor disbelieve it. Mm -hmm. So, and I can get more details as to about the multiverse and why I think that, you know, as we go down the pipe, but that's my short answer for everyone listening right now. TLDR. Okay. Not yet. Yeah. Yeah. For those of you know, I know most people come to these podcasts that they expect short answers and just to be done in 10 Mm -hmm. minutes, Mm -hmm. but, but for the, for the minority of you who stick on for longer, here's the rest of this. So the multiverse is not just a science fiction concept. It is a real physics concept that pertains to good old quantum mechanics. And that's where it arises from. In fact, uh, the, the real, the, the, the real, um, uh, word for this is not multiple, not called the multiverse. They call it the multiple worlds interpretation, MWI of quantum mechanics. That's the, that's the formal word for it. So if you so if you look for MWI, that's your initialism for it. Uh, by the way, I want to point out, yeah. as an aside, when I say initialism, I mean initialism and not acronym, because an initialism is a are letters all in a, in a row that you do not pronounce, like MWI, uh, whereas an acronym, like laser, is something you do pronounce. So FBI, for instance, is an initialism, not an acronym. That has nothing to do with the multiverse, though. So hey, just a little, little bit of an aside. That's something yeah. that is a pet peeve of mine. So um so the MWI is something that emerges from quantum mechanics, and it comes from people have probably heard of the Schrodinger's cat uh, paradox. Yes, yes. We, we, we talked about it on this podcast before, and it's very it's popular in pop culture. The idea is that you have you know some cat in a box, mm-hmm. and sorry, yeah, you, yeah, yeah, yeah and, um, some cat in a box, and based upon some random seeming event that is detected, such as the radioactive decay of an isotope or something, some random thing on a quantum mechanical level. Either the cat is delivered poison or not delivered poison. And because in quantum mechanics, we know that there's this that that there is this randomness and uncertainty 
as to whether or not these things happen on these small scales, whether they be electrons or their little radioactive decays, it's random that they that basically the cat is both dead and alive at the same time. And that's the paradox. And in fact, I believe Schrodinger put this out there, not just to say, look how weird quantum mechanics is. This cat's both dead and alive. He was trying to disprove this idea of quantum mechanics at the time because that's ridiculous. The cat can't be both dead and alive. Mm -hmm. And so this, to this day, still creates a lot of consternation among physicists and how to interpret this. How can these things all be the same thing at once? And, and, the, and, and the short answer for how people interpret these quantum mechanical events is that these things are, it is both dead and alive until you interact with it. And one way of interacting it with it is by observing it, opening the box and looking inside. Because even the act of opening the box and looking inside, as delicately as you try to open that box, you are still seeing that cat because of photons that have bounced off of it. And boom, they hit it, they interacted with it, bounced back to your eyes. Therefore, it's collapsed into one of two states. It's either dead or alive. So basically, the it's it's well accepted that lots of things, especially on a small scale, are in many places at once until you observe them. Specifically, you interact with them. The mm -hmm. fact that you are observing it is not especially magical. There are some people who try to say that just because you – the fact that, oh, your mind is involved must mean that your mind has must have some special physical quantum mechanical property. That, that's not true. It's just the fact that you've interacted with it. And so where the, multi, where the multiple worlds interpretation comes in is that it bothers a lot of physicists that why would this particular thing be true? The cat dead versus the cat alive. If it's random, why in our universe does the, our universe pick one of them as opposed to the many others? You know, if, if, if it's all random probabilities, why do we pick that one? Do all of the universes collapse into the universe that we, that we have today, all the possible universes, and this is the one that we have? Or, as the multiple worlds interpreters would say, well, actually... All of the worlds exist. There is a there is a world where the cat is both the cat is dead and the cat is alive. And our universes, when we observe the cat, they decohere. They split off in different directions, and basically branch is sort of the colloquial way of thinking it into getting to the two different worlds. Mm -hmm. And the same thing would be the true would be true probably any time any particle collapses from its many possible possibilities into just one. So that's why the multiple one of the many reasons people like this multiple world hypothesis is because then the world the universe still makes sense. It's not arbitrarily selecting a thing that happens. All of these things are happening. So and there are whole books written about this hypothesis, and it's still a popular physical concept today. Yeah. I know. Uh, there's the movie uh, Everything Everywhere All at Once uh, that a lot of people uh, have checked out. I have not seen it yet. I've, unfortunately, it does not sound like a date night movie uh, at okay. my house. <laughs> oh, well, so um, I hadn't heard of that one. I was going to suggest there's another movie. Very that, critically that, acclaimed. Oh, so there's another movie that's like maybe a smaller, more indie film called Coherence. I believe it's oh. on Amazon Prime right now if you have Amazon Prime. Emily actually sat me down to watch this one time without really telling me much about it. And I'm glad that she didn't. It's an interesting, it's basically sort of a mystery thriller film that brings up the idea of coherence between, you know, between different states of quantum mechanical particles and quite different universes. And so I'll, that's all I'll say about that movie in case you want to check yeah, it out. I would, I would now, check it out. Yeah, so I mean, and, and I think I don't think it's a very long movie. I think it's a pretty pretty short one. It's low budget, but they do a pretty good job with the low budget they have. So I recommend it uh, for any of your listeners. Uh, but as to why I do or do not believe it, um, it's because while the multiple worlds interpretation seems to make a lot of sense, and very and people who specialize in this, un unlike me, I I did not. I'm not a physics specialist. I minored in physics, so I, I know a little bit. Uh, but is it, but um. They, they have worked out a lot of the alleged um, problems with the theory. Like people had said things, hey, if you have multiple worlds splintering off, 
then doesn't that create new energy in each of those worlds? And then wouldn't that violate conservation of energy? There are those these kinds of questions that critics will justifiably yeah. ask. And they will they work very hard to resolve a lot of these uh, a lot of these paradoxes. And there's a whole book talking about it, I believe, by Sean Carroll, C-A-R-R-O-L-L. -L. Uh, he's a physicist at Caltech, uh, I believe. And he wrote a whole a popular science book, not a textbook. That so you so it's fairly accessible. I, so I hear I should read it, but I just I, I just saw people recommending it on him talking about the multiple worlds, and he he's a person who believes very strongly that there are multiple worlds. Now, why I don't believe it yet is just because an explanation seems very elegant, seems to make all the math work, seems to 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 explain a lot of things in a very elegant way, doesn't necessarily mean it's right. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's a good indication, but there's no rule ne necessary rule that the universe should have one equation, for instance, that's an inch long. That's something that people, a lot of physicists want to find. And mm -hmm. a lot of the history of physics has borne out where you can unify a lot of the laws of physics that seem really different and put them together in one more elegant framework. I mean, d d like so a classic example is uh, some of the four key quantities of, of physics, space and time, matter and energy. And we've now demonstrated convincingly through Einstein's relative, relativity that space-time is one concept, that you can warp space and time together. That's why massive objects will slow down time around them and shrink the space around them if they're, if they're super massive. And matter and energy, you know, E equals mc squared. I've heard that before, mm -hmm. right? Where E is where, where E is the energy and M is the mass, the matter part. And so there are these unifying concepts and they tend to be really interesting. But that is far from a guarantee that the answer to unifying everything even exists or is simple if you can even find it. So mm -hmm. until so until we learn more about how quantum mechanics works, especially how it unifies with you know, quantum mechanics, we tend to think is be the really tiny things it unifies with stuff that's really big and fast, like relativity, which is like massive stuff moving fast, um, which is a big open problem. I still have my doubts as to whether it's true. And the gold standard would be some kind of experiment. Yeah. Where. Yeah. Well, that was what I was going to ask. Is there any sort of research that's being conducted right now to determine if there is a multiverse or any other parallel universes? Well, one of the alleged criticisms is that it, there might not be a possible test to directly infer a multiverse or, or these multiple worlds as it's defined. And I don't know to what degree multiple world people agree with that. Um, but if that, but if that's val if, if that is true, then that is a very valid criticism as to whether that hypothesis is even science, because mm -hmm. by nature, a hypothesis needs to be falsifiable. There needs to be something that you can do that would say that, that would fly as evidence in the face of that hypothesis. And so if, um, you know, like, like, uh, so that often is what distinguishes science from non-science and that like something may be true, but cannot possibly be science. Like the classic example is how many angels dance on the head of a pin? I mean, we, we don't know. I mean, how would you write, make a test? It's like, well, if there's one angel, then this pin will weigh this much. It's like, well, no, no, angels don't weigh anything. It's like, well, okay, well, then that's, that, that's fine. But then that's not a hypothesis about how many angels there are on the head of a pin. So, and that's an ex extreme example, but one that we have to take seriously in regards to in regard to many sciences, including these very lofty and interesting physics hypotheses. Okay. Christian, did you happen to see that you placed this past week on the Outwit Out Play Out list for best Survivor t-shirt? I placed? Best Survivor oh, shirt, yes. yes. Really? Really? Yes. You ended uh, up on the list. Oh, that's, well, that's good. I'm glad I made that, that list. I, for, for the shirt's sake, sake, more than even my own, because that shirt went through the ringer, so to speak, uh, you know, for, for, for that experience. And it's a, and it's a kind of a one of a kind shirt mm -hmm. too, um, which still has not been washed. Right. If, if I before. got the story correctly, right. It was, this was Emily's shirt. Yeah. So it, or it, Emily's it, it was dad's a, shirt. It was like Emily's family. It came yeah. from a collection of shirts that her grandmother 
had at her at her at, at, at a grandma's house and her and Emily's parents were going through all these shirts of like, oh, here's your robot one, you know. Christian's a robot guy. Maybe he wants it. And mm-hmm. it's just this, like, it's this interesting, like, and that, like, oddity that it, it's uh, this, the cut of the shirt is not a modern cut of shirt. It's a very thin, long, and in my opinion, flattering on me shirt. And so, uh, and, and it had the tag in the front. I think I talked to you about this more. Like, the tag was yeah. in the front. And, mm-hmm. like, and to the point where the producers, when I, in my first interview, actually, you can probably see my very first interview on the show, you can see the tag flipping out on the front of the shirt. And after that, the producer came up and was like, excuse me, can I just a quick second? And he took out a, a switchblade and sliced it off the, mm-hmm. the tag. Uh, hopefully very careful, close to my throat. But yeah, uh, but yeah that's, uh, you know, to, you know, you know, talk about, you know, you know, backstabs or such. But that's, uh, but yeah, yeah. that's so it, they cut off the tag because it kept getting in the shot over and over again. So it's a unique shirt. So I'm thrilled that it placed. Okay. Yeah. Christian, um, Let's take another question. This one also yeah. happens to be from another anonymous listener. And uh, this question is, what is the best thing you've created using uh, Dolly Mini? Am I pronouncing that correctly? Yeah, I think it's, yeah, Dolly it's, uh, is is because it's, uh, I believe it's a, it's a, so Dolly Mini and is a, basically an art program. It's an AI software. Yeah. And that's uh, an that, acronym, right? Yeah, absolutely. I, I don't know what it's for, but it's one of those convenient what we call backronyms where you come up you like it wouldn't it be great if we had a salvador dali reference for our art generating algorithm and then you come up with a series of words that that <laughs> that create an acronym because it's pronounced dali not an initialism and uh, that uh that makes it sound that way uh mm-hmm. so you can some sometimes backronyms can get pretty hilarious and how stilted and and uh, contorted they are but this is a pretty good one and so, and for those, it's all the rage these days. I think it came out, it was released a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. I wonder. I've never been able to get on the website. Every time I go there, it's like too much traffic right now. Well, thankfully, right before the podcast today, I successfully went to Dolly Mini, where for those who don't know, you can just Google Dolly Mini, it's D A L L space E Mini. And there's a little prompt where you type in some sentence or description. And it will generate a series of candidate images for you. So mm-hmm. I typed in the phrase Rob Sesternino giving Christian Hubicki a Reuben sandwich. And uh it just gave me a bunch of pictures of Reuben sandwiches. So mm-hmm. I think I might have given it something a little too hard. But yeah. I've been impressed what I what I've seen other people have for their image generation. So the it, it is a is a pretty high quality image generation software. So I haven't done anything too crazy about it, but I would love to talk about the whole thing. Sure. Yeah. So there's a lot of very interesting AI news. And we're right now, we're in June of 2022. There's a lot of interesting AI news. We might talk about more of it in this podcast. But one of the big ones is the release of this Dolly, uh, this, this Dolly image generator. And I was reading the paper that was released about the image generation, just to get a little bit more context as to how as to how they're going about it. And the group that's working on it is something called OpenAI. It's a foundation that's that 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 not only generates these interesting artificial intelligence algorithms, but they also make their a lot of their information public. I, I want to. I'm not sure if the code is public or if you can request to have the code, but the, I believe the mission is they want it to be open. For anyone to view so that way people are presumably able to inspect what's going on so it's a little less scary when it's doing something you can actually peel back the curtain and say ah that's why it's doing what it's doing mm-hmm. um was image generation software i was looking it up and so it, it's a it's, it's a class one of the many classic now wonderful examples of deep learning that are that, that's being applied, and uh, I'm not a deep learning specialist. As a roboticist, we'll sometimes use deep learning methods, but I don't develop these a lot directly. So, so I I, I, I have to read a lot to get some context of it. But it's really fascinating in that what they essentially fed to this algorithm, they made it th- th- this 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 algorithm was a lot of training data of image of of images where let's say it's a let's say it's a picture of you and you and I. Um, okay. you and I, and we're like having coffee at a dinner table together and at, and, um, and someone or some algorithm has cropped out, like, this is a tape, like, like they basically made an outline of saying that's a table 
and kind of drew a little outline around the table. Like that is a person. I'm not sure if it goes as deep as Christian Hubicki. They have some other way of getting Christian Hubicki out of it or Rob Sesternino. But, and they give a bunch of training data of a bunch of images and they have this interesting set of neural networks that tra they train on all these images. And then the combination is then you can say, hey, I want Christian Hubicki and Rob Sesternino with a Ruben sandwich. And a lot of the time, it can actually put them together in a single image. And and some of the things are pretty darn great. Like, I think I saw there was like a Pikachu on a unicycle in a business suit. The paper on this is hilarious because you'll have this very serious paper talking about, you know, the, the methods employed, the training set. And there's a picture of a Pikachu on a unicycle in a business suit in it. So mm -hmm. that's kind of my dream to write a paper with a, with a, with that kind of image. I, I've, I've put in my own funny images and papers before, uh, but nothing quite like that. And so, but it's a, but it is in the scheme of things, it's another great You usually step have, you know, yeah. uh, Pikachu dressed much more informally. That's right. And, you know, yeah. sandals, Crocs, typically the Pikachu mm -hmm. Crocs, I think is a pretty popular one. Like I, I a track like, suit, right. He, yeah, I think, yeah, you, you know, Pikachu is not, is not a formal guy or girl. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it, it, Pikachu goes by their own rules. They're typically naked, to be clear. Right, right. And so, 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 so anyway, but it, yeah, and I think, it, like, for my papers, what I'll do sometimes is I, I, one of my favorite parts is drawing figures and diagrams for the papers and if i have a little too much coffee they can get a little in depth like i remember i had a i was coming up with a uh, with an algorithm for having robots do kind of general tasks and like for 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 getting from for moving from one side of a room to another or you know moving across the street and i was coming up with these creative scenarios one where i had a a robot had to had to run across the street to a mailbox to file its robot taxes so uh, before the 5 p.m. deadline this is when you had to do this in the mail. So I drew by I, I, I drew out a robot running across the street with a little robot tax uh, uh, document that I had to file at a robot mailbox. The robot mailbox has an antenna on it. That's how you know it's a robot mailbox. For the robot mailman, it was going to show up at 4.59 p.m. to pick up the mail. And so, um, yeah, that's in the published literature somewhere. So whoever can find that paper. Um, but back to the DALI. It, it's a, it's another example of how powerful these neural network tools tend to be, and that one of the big surprises of these of neural networks uh, over the past decade is how much you can, for the most part, stack them one after the other, after the other, after the other, after the other. You know, one neural network feeds into the next, into the next, into the next, and these neural networks. They're basically little math functions. They're little math equations. They're nothing, and, and, and in the scheme of things, nothing more compli complicated than it would be in a, a scientific calculator you might have had in like eighth grade, where it has the little, where if it has, if it has multiplication, division, addition, and also the little thing that says log or ln or the little, mm -hmm. or the little lowercase e symbol. You play if games has, on them too? I have a long history of making calculator games. We okay. That yeah, uh, those to, to be continued. Uh, I have I have uh, I, I have many memories of calculator games. But yeah, if you those calculators have all the functions you need for deep learning. Yeah. Uh, for the most part, and so these little neural networks, they're consists of little neurons that are just little math functions that are no more complicated than you'd have on a calculator, and then one, then when, then the result of one of those math functions feeds out the output number to the input of some other little neuron, which feeds into another one, another one, another one, another one. And there are, bil there, there are millions, sometimes billions of connections between these big neural networks. Mm -hmm. And the reason you can get, and so it's been amazing how well that they can figure out that, that you just add more neurons, more layers, the more stuff you can do. And that was one of the key insights. If you're wondering why AI has gotten so cool and awesome or scary, depending upon your perspective, it's because of the scalability of these neural networks. Um, and I would say the downside uh, of for in terms of getting these things to work is that the bigger the network gets, the more data you tend to have to give it. That's the high level view is that you have to train it. It doesn't come out of the box just automatically working. It, you have to give it a bunch of data to train on. And you have to, and there are lots of ways to do this. Like, and in this case, you would give what's called labeled data. Like it that you would give a picture and you'd say, in this picture, 
is a Reuben sandwich. In this picture is another Reuben sandwich. So it's able to say, okay, this thing's a Reuben sandwich, that's a Reuben sandwich, and it starts to put together patterns. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you give it a huge database. You have these like millions of image databases that they will give to these algorithms. And these, these neural networks will kind of smartly put it together to create what is something like the Dolly Mini. Okay. Christian, why does it make the images so creepy? I think faces particularly are very hard. Human okay. faces. Um, it's not like, is it a, a a tribute to Salvador Dali? Is that is it trying to, is, is that part of the joke? Uh, no, no. I think that the fact that the human faces are creepy in particular is because it's trying to mash faces into ways that they don't really belong. Now, Got to it. be, now there, because there are, there are networks out there like, you know, people, things that make deep fakes, uh, uh, you know, where it can assemble reasonably good making human faces. Right. But those are specialized networks. They are specialized for the task of doing human faces. This Dali has to take everything from Pikachu to unicycle to refrigerator. I've seen Jeff Probst show up. Uh, you know, it's a, yeah. uh, uh, and, and so, and, and um, in, in these things and, it, so it has to be a lot more general. So on some of the specifics, when it comes to human faces, I suspect that's one of the reasons it doesn't work so well. Now, okay. but what you say is very interesting, Rob, is that one thing you can get away with with the output of some of these networks is that, oh, if you act, it's just like art, that everything can look brilliant if you kind of squint and look the right way. It's like, yes, of course, the artist meant to make Jeff Probst have two noses. Mm -hmm. And that's meant to say that he could sniff out when players are lying to him at tribal council, that is a statement that they're trying to make. You could say. Yes, uh, absolutely. Now, Christian, did you give us the answer of what was the most interesting thing that you have made personally? Well, the only thing is I made that, personally yeah. is the Reuben sandwich. So technically that is the answer. Okay. That was my segue to well, talking about it. <laughs> yeah. While we are on this call, I actually yeah. managed to get my first Dolly mini through uh, and I share. can share it with you here. Uh, I asked uh, it to create a Paul Rubin sandwich. Okay. Okay. Are I'm a little ready? scared. I'm, I'm not sure I am, but go <laughs> ahead. <laughs> Are you ready to see a Paul Rubin's uh, sandwich? The world's not ready, but go on. Okay. Here we go. Paul Rubin sandwich. All right. Here it is. <laughs> Uh, that is for those who cannot see on the podcast, I'll do, let me do my best job to mm -hmm. explain what, 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 where, yeah. what we are looking at right now. So I'm, I'm maximizing on my screen so I can take a, all the glory that I have in front of it for yeah. us. First off, th there are no Reuben sandwiches present in this image. I should lead <laughs> off with it. There, there is simply Paul yeah. Reuben or what appears to be Hannibal Lecter who has removed Paul Reuben's skin and stretched it haphazardly over mm -hmm. his own face. Yeah. And I, I want to say eating a Reuben sandwich, uh, so a non-Reuben sandwich, but really it's more <laughs> holding his tongue open above <laughs> a partially, only a partially whole Reuben sandwich with no bites. Again, no, no Reuben sandwich. Um, and the eyes, yeah. If, so imagine Hannibal Lecter himself underneath the skin does not yeah. have eyes but instead some kind of wrinkled flaps of eye holes. Yeah. I'm done. Yeah. I think, yeah. And the sandwiches themselves, I mean, they're only marginally less creepy I think this than is Paul. the best one. Okay. The, okay. You pull it up this one. Yeah. 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 This one. Yeah. So it's, so he, so Rob has pulled up a, a particular, you are given a, a ready bunch of Paul Rubin images. Well, the by zoom the way, in is a much worse. Yeah, yeah. It's a little low. This is the, this emphasis on the mini for the mini resolution for Dolly mini. And ah! yeah, <laughs> at the very least. So the face that Paul Rubin appears to be making does sound like he is making a Pee Wee's Playhouse noise. And he has just, sliced one of his friends in the peewee playhouse in half it's like one of those is it cake things it's but Let's is it, it a sandwich scream real loud yeah. <laughs> uh yeah that could be a that could be one of those like lord of the rings villains i feel like that uh, <laughs> um, that paul rubin yeah so uh <laughs> okay 
Can I tell so, you? So, that, yeah, now that ahead. I was able to get through, uh, yes. I feel like okay, maybe there's here's here's what I would want to do, and maybe I'll okay. spend Friday doing this. I want to take uh, survivor player names, okay, yes. and um, and put them in to Dolly Mini, and, and see if we get any interesting results. Like Mike Chisel. Well, let's see what happens. Yeah, it has to be ones where there's puns in the right, name. Phil, right, Philip Shepard. Philip Shepard. What, what Phil, that would give us? Maybe I'll just tweet them out, and people could tell me what the, what what uh, what this is. That'd be a fun, that would be a fun tweet Twitter thread to see what people get as their responses. You can crowdsource the actual image generation, so you don't have to wait to get, to get through with Dolly Mini. Yeah, so, that, it's yeah. the game within the game. That we're <laughs> waiting for. Oh, yeah. side, this will be the sign of our times. This will be one of those mid-2022 mm -hmm. uh, um, relics. It's like, you remember when people made all those weird Brady Bunch images of, yeah. of, of things? Oh, so, definitely yeah. when Mike Bloom and I do the uh, best of 2022 Brant Steel, Dolly Mini, uh, save a spot. Yeah, fantastic. Okay. Um, yep. Okay. Let me see. Okay. I, 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 I uh, tried out Philip Shepard. And so let's see uh, what, what, what <laughs> it, take, it takes a minute. It's not like uh, one of these instant yeah. results. Okay. Well, I mean, right. and, and, and yeah, yeah. Let me know when you get it. I mean, like, cause, cause so those who are doing this, keeping in mind that, you know, number one, it's a lot of people probably asking to, to request this is like some servers somewhere are having to process that this. And one of the reasons that these, neural networks can take so long. I mean, it's because, I mean, they, it, it's a lot of processing power sometimes to, um, uh, uh, to, to churn your input out to these neural networks. In fact, uh, what people have generally done is they've used graphics processing units, GPUs. These are the video cards that people used to just use for video games. And now people in AI love to use them and occasional crypto miners. Uh, yeah. so, uh, so now they're much more expensive. It's very hard for me to buy a decent video card when the crypto market is up. So the fact that it's oh, well, you should be able to get one now, Christian. Yep. <laughs> I, I actually just had a meeting with my lab and said, Hey, everybody, the people who knew new video cards for their computers, now's the time. So that's what I told them. So, yeah. All right. So let's see. Um, I, I think that. I feel like that this is uh, somewhat relevant to what we're talking about right now. So why don't we take this question uh, from Trevor Neese, who says, okay. do you think the Google AI scientists claim that there is a, a sentient being in the facility holds any weight? So this is a big news item recently. I, I think yes. you covered it even on uh, News Even AF, on right? News AF, yes. Yeah. I mean, that's how you know it's made it big if it made it to mm -hmm. News AF. So, yeah. So there was one of the Google, for those background who needed background on this, who hadn't heard about this, because I certainly did, that there was mm -hmm. a Google engineer who was interfacing with one of these chat bots that called Lambda that uh, that Google is, is developing. And I, I was watching an older presentation on Lambda, and the idea is that Google wants to make a chat bot that would make it easier for people to interface with their devices, like a like a better Siri, like where Siri is a bit more interactive. Siri can give you more context as to what Siri can do. And they they try to demonstrate it by saying, hey, we made this chat bot pretend it's the planet Pluto. And they and they were and and the and and the thing would say, hey, you know, it's very nice being Pluto. And you would say, hey, what's nice about it? It's like, well, I love the fact that I am off in the distance and I can view the view the stars from here. It's like it's pretty good sort of narrative building uh, that it's able to do. And a one of these these Google researchers was was sort of vetting one of these chatbots. A lot of people have to do this. And one of the things that they actually, he, I think this this gentleman was trying to do, one of his jobs is to um, check for, quote, unsafe uh, results. And unsafe, I, I feel like I should clarify what that means because what Google is often looking for is that, is this going to say something that is offensive? Mm -hmm. Is it going to say something that is uh, like, there's a, there are famous examples. I'm trying to remember uh, the name of, of one of Microsoft's bots that it tried to do. They tried to do a chat bot that was on, basically put it on Twitter and a bunch of, and, and ended up saying some very politically, 
let's just say 1930s it's germany things uh okay. coming out yeah so it so it basically it became a really uh, uh not a not a not a not a good internet citizen very quickly based upon what it was learning from what from what trolls were typing at it and mm -hmm. so this is something that yeah. people garbage in serious. garbage out that's that's basically the name of the game when it comes to AI, yeah. and this is a perfect example of that. So, seeing if it, you know if, if if it would be a high quality interactive, it would say anything that would make people uh, uncomfortable, or, or even to a lesser extent, or it, it, and and so they were he was probing it for that information, and the chatbot and the chatbot is is pretty good. It's gone. These chatbots have gotten much better. In the past few years, it feels I feel like I have not to bring up something during one of these breaks here. So what for what the chatbots used to sound like even a decade ago, and but now he started talking to it and the, the it started pontificating on life and you know what it, you know I think my and the and, and it said something to the effect of like I think of myself as a human as a thing that should be respected with rights. I'm like, oh no, uh, great. And I'm thinking, and I'm, what I'm thinking is like, this is going to just make all the headlines. This is going to be, but what in, in the end of the day, you have to remember what is actually going on behind the scenes. And mm -hmm. thankfully Google put out a paper on how this is put together, that this is a chat bot. And what it is do, what it has done is it has been given many, many, many examples of other people's conversations. Okay. And it is not just regurgitating past conversations, but it is stitching together patterns of speech from other people's conversations. And what is it trained to do? It is actually being trained on a few metrics. And it's being trained on is what it's saying seem to make sense? And people will, and people, engineers will chat with it and say, yes, no, yes, no. Is what it's saying additive and interesting? So you could ask it, how are you feeling today? Fine. And it's like, okay, maybe that's correct and correct sounding, but it doesn't add anything. But it'll give it a point if it says something like, oh, it's I'm fine today because, you know, I had a wonderful conversation with a colleague earlier. Oh, it's added something, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's being trained to basically add things to a conversation. So it almost sounds like a person – at a converse, at a party you're talking to who almost sounds interesting until you think deeply about what they're saying, right? And I, I think some of us can, can master that art when we need to, you know, you just say something to fill the conversation. And that that's to me, it's pretty obvious to me what it's doing. But at the same time, if you're not thinking super critically, sometimes things can sound super profound if you don't like right. you delve into it. And that's that's what I get from this. And, and it's backed up by the actual papers and what's going on behind the scenes. And the original papers were even saying things like, be careful not to anthropomorphize this thing. Just because it's saying things that are similar to what people sound like, which is a huge accomplishment, let me say, does not, it is not actually referring to any external reality. Like one of the things it was talking about was a, a story. It was given a story. It's like uh, by by the by the by the engineer talking to it, saying, "Hey, you know, a a a a young girl is holding a flower, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing the story. And a, and a young boy she's talking to closes the hand and crushes the flower. And the thing describes is like, well, you know, it's very sad that it has crushed the, this beautiful flower that was in her hand, and." And but it is it doesn't know what a hand is to any external reality. It doesn't have a concept of what even a flower is, only in relation to other conversations that it has. So yeah. so it's not really relaying some external experience through language. It is directly generating the language so that way it we can we so that way it can interface with us. So it's a big difference. As yeah. and that's why it's not sentient to me in any way. So. Yeah, one of the things that I had uh, seen, I, I watched a bunch of videos about this, was that uh, it was described that uh, this technology uh, that that Google had, had been working on basically, you know, has been fed all of this data, including yeah. like every, you know, screenplay, you know, on the Internet and, and yeah. anything like that. So if you are sort of like playing the role of a person who is looking to find like a sentient life in the form of a, you know, artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. like, and you ask, and you are sort of like asking a question, like it will give you an answer 
that you might see in a movie where uh, artificial intelligence uh, starts to become sentient. But it does not mean it, it's it's, you know, just because a parrot repeats words doesn't necessarily mean that the parrot knows what the words mean. Yeah, exactly. And I was going to make the parrot analogy myself as well. And let me just build Shout a parrot out to Omer. analogy. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. 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 He, yeah. He, I love his bird facts, by the way. Omer uh, put mm-hmm. this great bird facts on the internet. I, I, I love I, as, as a as a wannabe bird enthusiast. I like when he when he puts those out there. Um, the the and, and to the credit of the algorithm, it is thoughtfully putting together things it has or, or at least i would say compellingly i would say th- put together a lot of these things like oh that's kind of a neat turn of phrase that it put together and but that does you know but i think but i think as think of it as a very high-tech parrot is not a bad way to think about it when you're thinking about what's going on beneath the surface um now that said you know there's a, it does bring up a lot of interesting thoughts and questions about this uh about this whole endeavor like this whole kerfuffle because this engineer raised a red flag at Google saying and sent out an email saying, Hey, this thing is sentient. I want to protect it. And Google's like, it needs a lawyer. Yeah. It needs a lawyer. It's like, and, and so, and I'm not going to defend the practices of Google's HR policy or anything, but you know, I imagine that puts them in a tough spot where they're like, uh, you know, I, uh, we just don't see it. It just doesn't make sense. And then he went, then he blew the whistle out in public, this engineer. Mm-hmm. So the Washington, the Washington Post covered it. Right. It was all over the place, right? And um, and so they put him on leave, and that's why it's a it's a it's a controversy. And one of the main reasons it's a controversy. And for, and where this gives me a headache is just knowing that um, every news outlet's going to pick up on it from there because instantly, once you have robot becomes self aware, that's every movie, right? That, that, that like that's about like the, all these sci fi movies, and so that gets so many clicks. So it's going to take off. And the reason I get – and there are interesting discussions to be had, in my opinion. I think that one thing that this brings up is, like, how do we define sentience, right? If we can't know it necess- – if we can be fooled by talking to it, then maybe this thing is sentient if we're – you know, it, like, you know, that, that, I think that, that raises some questions as to how would you define it in a broader context. Mm-hmm. I think that raises those questions. Those are interesting to me. At this point, very academic questions. To be clear, um, what what frustrates me on some level is that these the, the the common narratives that I that you get out of AI when people talk about it in the media or or on social media is one: the robots will decide they don't need us and then to kill us all, or you know they're just gonna be or they'll become self aware in general. And while those things are not incredible they're not they're not totally impossible in the realm of physics just because anything when we're self-aware we can do things terrible but I mean, uh, there might be a multiverse yeah there may be a multiverse like i'm, I'm not saying those things are in te- inherently impossible mm-hmm. but when i it seems to distort what are often the real present issues today in terms of machine learning and ai that people that that a lot of the experts talk about and this is not even just me because I'm not technically – this is not my subfield. Is not is not these AI methods. But I, before I came on today, I wanted to go find – just to clarify that I'm not that, – that, that just to see if I am not completely off base here, that I went and looked at a bunch of conferences. This is a good trick, by the way. For anyone who's curious about a topic and wants to know what, this, uh, what a lot of the experts think about it, go find online – the scientific conferences about it, which are which are hosted by some major scientific organization, and there are conferences on rope on, on AI and ethics in society. The, these things exist with real academic and professionals who write research papers, who peer review journals, and you can go and watch the keynote speeches of these top researchers talking about this exact field. I just today, I, I have to find the conference, but I, I, th- I think the it was a conference on AI ethics in society, I believe. And I and, and there's a conference coming up in a couple of months, but I went to last year's keynote speeches. I watched them. And I wanted to see what topics that they are covering. Were any of them talking about this becoming self-aware and us mistreating the AI. And I went to look through all the paper titles and everything. I like, that just doesn't really show up. What it's about instead are about things we also hear about, which are inequities with how machine learning and AI is presented in society. I mean, when you, uh, you know, if you, if you have, for instance, an algorithm at a company 
that's job is to sort out candidates for jobs. And it has been trained on data based upon who are currently candidates, who are currently people who are successful in the job. And for a variety of systemic reasons, those people tend to be of a certain racial and gender subgroup, often in tech companies, that's white men. Well, guess, well, a lot of times it will find ways to select more of the same and encoding of an existing bias in the right. future. Yeah. And is is that sort of also sort of like, hey, well, like, hey, well, the computer did it. Uh, you know, we, we turned it over to yeah. AI. Yeah, and then there's there wasn't some, yes. there wasn't our, there's no there was no discrimination because uh, the computer uh did, we we got the results from the, the you know it wasn't us. That's very astute, Rob. That's exactly what a lot of people initially respond with. It's like, hey, look, there's we totally talk about bias. There are no people in the loop, but actually there are. These things are trained on data that we as humans decide to give it, and so we so and and so if we're not careful about how what data we put into an algorithm will garbage in garbage out like you said and guess almost all the talks that i was looking at uh, about these professionals like these are like these are like ns national science foundation career award winning professionals giving talk they're talking about that stuff but mm -hmm. of course that's going to get drowned out if you have a very sensational headline of secret algorithm inside of google has become self aware which is almost literally a movie plot Right. And so my frustration is in sort of the distortion of priorities because, you know, there are ethical concerns with any technology and AI is certainly one of them. So I would recommend to any audience members, just, you know, if you Google AI ethics conferences, you can go and watch the and I'll post a link uh, after the fact. Some of these interesting uh, 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 keynote talks from these esteemed, you know, researchers and scientists about what they think, what they're focusing on, and what they think are real problematic issues. And what they tend to be, it's less about treating some computer program badly. It's about us making sure we don't treat each other badly. That's where a lot of the safety and ethical concerns tend to come into play. Christian, we've done a lot of science questions here to start. Yeah. Uh, this yeah. one, I'm not sure if this is exactly science, but we'd love to get your take on this question from sure. Doug Cutchins, okay. who wants to know, are you team wheels or team doors? Uh, this is a question that a lot of people were talking about on the internet uh, a couple months ago. Okay. But do you believe, are, are there more doors in the world or are there more wheels in the world well i'm glad i'm getting this question today because if i got this question last week i wouldn't have known what they were talking about because i was at the conference and someone after my talk uh, that i had given they're like so are there more wheels or doors in the world and i'd never heard that 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 question before my tldr answer is i think there's more doors i'm team doors okay interesting yeah, and I'll, and, I'll, and I'll tell you what specifically I lead to because sadly, well, sadly, these things, questions always have the same kind of first que follow-up question, which is how do you define wheels? How do you define doors? And mm -hmm. that can wildly change your answer. Because um, the first, the first things I jump to that would lead to a lot of wheels is like, how do you define a wheel? Is it something that is rolling? And, uh, and, and and therefore moving relative to some other yeah. body it's touching, right? So like a car wheel is rolling and moving relative to the to the ground. And I tr whenever it comes to these large, what we call order of magnitude estimates, meaning that like we're kind of this big guess, or like a big numbers, where we tend not to care about the ones and the twos, what we can are, care about are the tens, the hundreds, the millions, the billions, the the zeros on the end, those are the orders of magnitude. I think about industry, not just what's in our homes, but what's out in industry. Because we, we we live around our homes a lot. We see how many doors are in our houses or how many doors and wheels are on our cars. But sometimes massive industries have lots of little mechanisms that have wheels. Uh, if you've ever been, if you've ever seen a little, like little conveyor belts, uh, in, in a factory, there are all these little rollers that push along little like your packages, your Amazon packages. Well, that's going to be like thousands, if not millions of wheels in your mm -hmm. factory. And I think, and that cannot be, I think, what people mean when they're talking about wheels. If they are, I'm probably team wheels for, 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 for things like that. 
Uh, but if I restrict my definition to wheels and doors in this context should mean things that are roughly human scale and are designed to transport or, or, or accommodate humans mm -hmm. just in, from, from our, from our, from our perspective. That way you don't have these tiny little wheels all adding up. Every bearing and every machine would be a wheel, <laughs> you know, that, that, then that, that, that would blow it out of the water. But at that point I start to be more team doors. Mm -hmm. I try to think about where door, how, you know, where are the wheels that push us along relative to the, how many doors there are. And if I, and I, I certainly in my house, I have many more doors than wheels, even in cars, cars tend to have roughly as many doors as wheels. I mean, tractor trailers. Oh, but, interesting. Like, yeah. I didn't think about yeah. car, car doors. Yeah. Car doors. That, like I put car. So anytime I try to find a time where a wheel would have an advantage, sure. you've got an yeah, 18 I, wheeler out there, maybe only has yeah. two doors, but uh, most of the cars, four wheels, four doors. Yeah, and, and on top of that, you have every building, and you know, is, has you know has every has a door probably for each room. And I'm thinking about that in terms of the United States. You also have to. I'm trying to think about um, how about cabinets. The, Are we counting cabinets? Uh, ca uh, uh, oh, if we count cabinets, I think they were blowing it out of the way. I, I would say a cabinet is not designed to accommodate a person going through it. Hmm. So. Okay. Yeah. And so, and so I would, so by my, just like I'd have to exclude the tiny wheels that exist in every bearing, I would probably just as just to argumentatively say, we shouldn't count those doors too, because then that'll be extra team doors for everything that would. What's every steering count. wheels? Is the steering wheel a wheel? I, I would say it doesn't transport a person, but I think okay. even if you included steering wheels, I don't, I think doors would still win yeah. in my, in my book. Like I, I'm trying to find the reason that it wouldn't be doors how many wheels would you have to admit that you like every office building uh you know every you know like how many doors are in, in like in a skyscraper but i should say skyscrapers are probably well outnumbered mm -hmm. by many other buildings so maybe we now, shouldn't think about this how about yeah. bicycles we count two bicycles wheels yeah per person. two wheels is a lot of bicycles a lot of bicycles i was thinking about i was thinking about like something in east asian countries where a lot of people ride bikes and so each person might have a two-wheeled bicycle and is there also one door per person in a home? As I'm trying to do, it's hard to do order of magnitude at that point. I would think that that's something that might even the scales a bit, but because there's two per person, but you still have like per person living in a home. I mean, I'm trying to think about like a like like an apartment in China, for instance, just so it's a place I don't live. It might be a little bit different culture than me, and because uh, it's easy to be Americentric in this, um, they might have a every every person might have a bicycle. Which have two wheels, but maybe just one approximately less, less than one door per person. I don't mm -hmm. know. So maybe that evens it a bit because so many people would have bicycle more bicycles than cars in certain parts of the country. That would be the closest thing. But I still, given the fact that these people have to go to some kind of work, you know, have to, you know, maybe they have to. Mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah, I, I, I feel in that that, and there's still a lot of cars in those countries too that have many doors. Yeah, yeah. It's You're making a compelling case. Yeah. So my money's on doors for for definition of something that people would go through. I would have said wheels in a landslide, but you know, um, no, you're talking me into it. If we if we're counting car doors as doors, I, I don't know how wheels uh, gets it. Yeah, that I think because that, that really evens the balance. Like, where are most of the wheels in the world if you exclude these factory settings, these these factory these factory things? Mm -hmm. I mean, I was I was trying to go for like that's where I always thought that the hidden thing would be like something in industry that we don't see on a daily basis and wouldn't think of as a wheel. But if you exclude those, then I think it's doors. Okay, all right. How about this question from uh, Felipe, who says? Yeah. Do you think we'll ever see a survivor contestant with machine a machine learning background apply reinforcement uh, learning principles to win the game, or is survivor too fast paced to train on the fly, uh, learn from and improve uh, upon errors? Okay, so so I like I like the thrust. Of this and question. could you explain in yeah. in your own words uh, what this question is asking? Sure. Sure. So, so like I'm a roboticist mostly, which we do some machine learning. And so like the analogy would be, you know, like when I went on Survivor, I applied a lot of robotics principles and algorithms to things on the show. And it, probably honestly, the thing I'm most proud of, of my time on the show is yeah. getting to talk about those algorithms on it. That's awesome. And I can, I can play those in my lectures. <laughs> that's a, that, that's a, typically a hit. Um, 
Someone who is a more machine, directly machine learning background, not necessarily in the context of the robotics, or robotics, could could they do something similar? And I think the answer is absolutely yes. They could make analogies to it. And now, so in terms of how they explain what they do, I think there's a lot of analogies that you can draw. Now, the question is how directly useful are the insights from reinforcement learning? And for those who don't know what reinforcement learning is, it's it's a, a subset of this grand thing of machine learning where it's a little different than, say, the DALI uh, or the example where you are training it with this is a picture of a cat and I have labeled it a cat. This is a picture of Rob. I have labeled it Rob. You will learn that these things are cat and Rob. If you do not, and, and so I have supervised to tell you what are the right answers to these questions. Now you can sort of play between the lines, right? A reinforcement learner is it's, it's also trained, but a little differently. It is trained with rewards, kind of like giving a treat to a dog. You'd say, that thing you did, I didn't tell you exactly what to do, but I'm going to give you a treat for that. And, uh, and it's like, oh, you didn't like that? I'm uh, taking the treat away. Okay. You, you, that, you can actually give it a, a numerical reward for good or bad. And we can design uh, whether or not, uh, and, we can, and we can have some algorithm, a reinforcement learning algorithm, design a number of things using uh, these rewards. And uh, one recent example is there, there was a, a fusion reactor. And fusion reactions are this kind of holy grail of renewable energy. Yeah. You can basically get uh, uh, tritium or whatever, or, or heavy, basically have from heavy water in the ocean, we can power these reactions that are clean and safe. And we can make fusion reactions right now, but the problem is, is that they take too much energy to run. They take more energy to contain this fusion plasma, this fusing plasma, uh, it takes more energy to do to contain it than it than it than it than you get out from actually running the plant. So it doesn't actually get you any additional energy production, right? Uh, and one of the challenges is these magnetic fields that you have to fire at this this sort of like donut of imagine a donut of swirling plasma, and plasma is just like kind of this really just really kind of hot stuff. Really, it's another phase of matter. There mm -hmm. are more than three phases of matter, kids. Don't let any, don't let adults tell you otherwise. There are many phases of matter. Don't let them lie to you. The uh, and plasma is probably the most abundant, uh, most the most abundant uh, phase in the universe. Um, oh, interesting. Of matter, I believe. Yeah, because stars are plasma. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, and Pluto and and Dominic Pluto is not a tiny star. It is a it is a dwarf planet. It's a little different. So if you're listening, mm -hmm. Dominic, the years mm -hmm. from now. So um and so there so pla it's it's circulating plasma and kind of in a donut. And you have to use and plasma often has an electric charge to it. So the way you turn it is by firing a magnetic field at it. But it has to be very carefully uh, modulated, sort of this this very tweak, this magnetic field has to be changing. So it's a control problem. And so scientists recently used reinforcement learning to break this barrier of finally making a power plant using a reinforcement learning algorithm to figure out how to contain the plasma in a way that takes less energy than you, than you get out. So your actual net energy production for a brief period of time, but an important period of time was achieved using reinforcement learning. And they specifically, I believe, trained it in a computer simulation of the plasma first in order to get it onto the, uh, in, in, in order to get it onto the, the plant. It's that way you don't have to run the plant for a long time and do lots and lots mm -hmm. of guesses and checks, mm -hmm. right? So um, that's, so that simulation. Well, that's great news. Makes, yeah, it's great news. So, so it's, it's it's something super cool, and hopefully that can be extended. And reinforcement learning is pretty darn cool. People in my field are using it with legged robots. Uh, I have some colleagues at Oregon State University where I got my PhD. Some people working in the lab where I got my PhD, they're they're messing around with reinforcement learning directly, and they've got a robot that's climbing upstairs blindfolded, and uh, so it's like with, with without arms and not falling down. So it's incredible what they're doing up there. So, and, and the way they do it is because it, that they, they train it sometimes in the computer simulation first. And that's, that's a technique called sim to real that you simulate, you, you run, you, you run, run in a simulation, get it to work and then you put it on a real thing and it actually works. And, um, and they get, and they get a result. And so you just have to design, you have to decide what you're rewarding. With, uh, with plasma, you're probably rewarding uh, containing the plasma for as little energy as possible. For a walking robot, you're probably rewarding moving forward while using not too much energy or not falling down, right? So 
Sorry. So that's cool, right? Yeah. Now back to this question about Survivor. Could you actually use it? And the pro one of the issues with this technique, as opposed as well as other deep learning based techniques, is they take they're often called big data techniques, meaning you need a lot of data. Um, and Survivor, there's not a ton of data in the scheme of things. We have 42 seasons of American Survivor plus I'd say a few dozen others from International Survivor. Mm -hmm. So we're talking probably under 100 data points of seasons. Maybe you can multiply out to a number of uh, tribal councils, maybe multiply that out further to a number of votes. But it's not a ton of data for which for you to extract information from. And further, that that's just a data analysis tool where you're looking at a bunch of data we already have. As opposed to what reinforcement learning is doing is that we are trying something and then saying, do I reward that or do I penalize that? And it's hard to do that on Survivor because often a penalty on Survivor is you're voted out and you don't get another second shot to try again and learn from your mistakes. Mm -hmm. So it, so the applicability might be tricky uh, in, in, the, in the context of actually being out on the island. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, I also think that you would have imperfect information, uh, just sticking with our theme of like garbage in, garbage out. Like, unless you like were like, uh, unless you were playing Survivor in a simulation and uh, this system had access to your, you know, 17 other competitors, uh, like uh, brains, mm -hmm. like, how could you, how could you have the, you know, uh, information and the data to know? the correct moves to be making in any given situation. So that's a good question. That's a good point and a good question. And that's something we in robotics is an issue as well. Uh, that that if you know everything, that all all the thing you you have every state of your system measured, everyone's mood, for instance, in this case. In robotics, it would be like, do I know the position and speed of all of my joints of my robot and where I'm at? Right. That's called that that, that that's uh, that condition is called observability observability where you can measure all these things or, or infer what they all are. In reality, we have something called partial observability. I actually talk about this in one of my lectures that I do uh, on, on combining robotics and survivor that I've given a few times. And so where you don't know a lot of things, right? Now that makes things harder. That's true. But that still doesn't, that doesn't, that doesn't mean that you can't do anything, that you can't know anything, right? That certainly makes things harder though these partial observable conditions. So um, so an example of this would be my friends at Oregon State who are able to um, make a robot climb stairs even if it doesn't know the stairs are there, right? And so like, it just kind of feels like, oh goodness, I just, I, I touched down my foot higher than I expected. Maybe I'm on some kind of stair, I don't know. And it will kind of kick its foot around in a way that hopefully will catch it and will end up kind of climbing the stairs. That's my quick mm -hmm. ex explanation of what they're doing there. So it, it's, but it's still tricky. Now, if you ask me what would, if I wanted to apply these machine learning techniques to Survivor, uh, I would do it in a very simple simulation. And the, the simulation will be imperfect. It'll be in an imperfect model of Survivor and to a huge degree. Um, but we have a saying when it comes to models is that all models are wrong, but some are useful. And uh, it's, 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 a it's, a, it's, a, it's a very old adage when it comes to science that all models are wrong, but some are useful. They're all wrong in some way. And, but are they, in, but are, are they useful in some way? In fact, I'll give you an example from my field of a model that's very simple that but people tend to use. Uh, I, I, I was just at a conference on, on human locomotion. On, it's, com it's, a com it's a Human it a conference. locomotion. So mean, mean, how, how do we walk and run? How do people okay. walk and run, right? And, and, and a lot of roboticists like myself go to this conference. And, um, and one way that a lot of these people who study the biology of how humans walk is they will actually create a little mathematical simulation of a person. And they're not modeling all, they're not putting in equations for all of the, the skeletal muscles, the skeleton, the bones, the tendons. They're not doing any of that. They're treating the person like it is a like it is just a ball with a mass on a spring, like a pogo stick. And that little bouncing that it will do uh, is actually very similar to if you, to the bouncing that we do when we are running forward, you can actually measure where the our center of gravity is, or we'll specifically call it the center of mass when we are running forward. 
and it is bouncing eerily like a pogo stick. So people will do studies where they will simulate a person as a pogo stick. It's got a special name. We don't call it the pogo stick. Maybe we should. Um, and um, make predictions as to what people will do when they maybe step in a pothole. And they're mm -hmm. pretty good. They're pretty – it's a useful model. So when I come back to Survivor, I would – and I, I probably thrown this challenge out to your, your, to your esteemed listeners before – I would love to come up with a computer model, a simple computer model that simulates kind of like a brand steel of how people of, of how people interact. And there might be a useful way that we and it could have very simple principles. It could be like, you know, if I vote with someone, they're more likely to vote with me next time. If someone uh, if I tell someone to vote one way and they vote some other way, I'm less likely to vote with them next time. Very simple rules. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious what kind of information that would give me that I could apply to the game. Not an easy problem, but an interesting one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it, would it tell us more about the game of Survivor? Um, but, but would it tell us anything that maybe we don't already know that might not be common sense? Where it's like, yes, yeah, like ideally you should get people to vote with you. Yeah, yeah, that thing's that's the, the the rules. That's that's another tricky part. And so the rules we'd have to you'd have. So the idea would be you would have to look at the outcomes of say a lot of games. You could we could you, if we had these rules, we could set up a bunch of games, see how they turn out. And sometimes there are little correlations that we might not have noticed before. Right. Uh, like one thing I that's come up on the podcast before that I believe I have to credit Adam Klein to is the the idea that if you are at the merge. And you are on the wrong side of the vote, you are far less likely to win than if you are on the right side of that vote. And I haven't done like the detailed statistics of it. I mean, the, the superficial statistics look really compelling. I believe one. I think if you're Rob as a fact checker person on mm -hmm. Twitter, I think he even talked about this and what and, and and went through all the data. I want to say I want. To, I believe it was that person uh, who does that work. And. Now, we, that's just the data that we have. Now, imagine we could run a bunch of yeah. simulations far more. Maybe there are other little things not, that are Not the case in your own season of Survivor, correct? Uh, no, well, I'll, I, well on, on our own season, all of us voted out Elizabeth at the merge. And part of that was, in my head, I don't want to be on the wrong side of this vote. Because if I'm on the wrong side of this vote, I'm very unlikely to win this game. Uh, I remember I actually applied that concept. It was, mm -hmm. a, it was a 12 to 1 vote against the Oh, it was 12 to 1. Okay. Yeah, 12, 12 to 1. Uh, so, it, like, there, but there was a pressure that, you know, you don't want to get off on the wrong foot with all these people you're just meeting for the first time. Mm -hmm. And so, so, and, and I, I, and I think it's a little bit of a, a predestination that I actually was aware of the statistic from Adam. And, uh, and one of the reasons that I was like, I, I can't throw a hinky vote. Against not against someone other than Elizabeth, because I think that it's likely it's uh, 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 like there could be some causal relationship here with not doing well in the game. But mm -hmm. uh, it was a particular, but it was a particular vote that seemed to be very important. So yeah. it's possible that like there are other patterns like that. I had uh, misremembered that in my head, where I had thought oh. that the uh, Davids uh, were trying to keep Elizabeth, and I remember uh, maybe Carl uh, was the only person who was like, "Yeah, let her go." Well, I mean, how dare you misremember a single vote from the forty-two seasons of Survivor mm -hmm. that you were? But yeah, that but that was that was that was the that was the vibe of the episode. I would vibe, say, Rob, yeah, that, but not, that we but not all, the outcome. Yeah, exactly. I think it was at, at the end it was sort of anticlimactic because we all wanted to save her, and we're like, oh, we can't, and we were kind of toast at that point. So, okay, let's get your opinion on this question from Brent, who says, "How much would?" Would a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? Now, you know, we get the questions. Mm -hmm. You know, Christian will take a look at the, what we've got and then yep. give us a sense of like, uh, what does he want to talk about? Yep. Why did you want to talk about <laughs> this question about the woodchuck? Well, I, it was the first time that I, I, I saw you love Chuck McGill. I, I, I do love Chuck McGill from Better Call Saul, one of my favorite characters. And but I, I, of course, it's a, it's, I'm sure a throwaway question that someone put in there. You know, no offense to the person who did, but it actually got me thinking: How would one answer this question? Yeah, I mean, like, it's like, it's more of a thought process kind of proof of concept question. How, how do you go about thinking about it? And 
So I, they got me tripping down this puzzle, and I ended up doing some math shortly before I got on the podcast. So I figured I would 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 uh, would take a stab at this. And let's let's break it down. How much wood would a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? So first off, I want to point out that a woodchuck is a groundhog. They are exactly the same thing. A woodchuck is a groundhog. So if you're ever curious about what it is, it's Punxsutawney Phil. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how much wood could it chuck? Now, I it's an old-timey phrase. So I was curious if chucking wood was some kind of old-timey phrase that meant something other than throwing things, but it does not appear to be. Because I mean, things like the, the, like the, the, a lot of these phrases have weird origins that I had no I no idea. Uh, I did you, like mm -hmm. I have ever talked about the phrase chip on your shoulder, uh, like that where that comes from. It's like I don't think weird, so. Not that I it's, recall. It's, I looked it up at one point because, like, what does that even mean? Have a chip on a shoulder? I imagine someone having like a little indentation on their shoulder from like a, a wound that someone like tried to stab yeah. them or something like that, and they had like a like a wound, a chip on their shoulder. No, it's apparently goes back to the lump time of lumbering or uh, the lumber industry, where people where there was where there was a practice for people who would haul lumber that as a, that just as a courtesy that uh, for your job. That whatever lumber you cut down for the day, that's all cool. But you could take home as much lumber that you could carry on your shoulders just as a courtesy. Okay. A chip that was called a chip, a chip of wood. So like a whole, mm -hmm. and it's not a tiny chip, it's a it's a whole freaking log. And that yeah. I imagine would be something that people would want to, you know, to, to fuel their homes. And but then there were new policies uh that uh, that the that people that the that the owners of the companies would implement said no more, no more chips of wood. And basically. What the people, what the what the workers would do, would carry some wood on their shoulder up to the people overseeing them, put it on their shoulder, and dare them to knock it off. Like I dare you to knock this wood, this chip off of my shoulder. Mm -hmm. And um, so, by, well, so I like, mean, wood, they're like brawny lumberjack types. Yeah, you're gonna, exactly. who's gonna mess with them. Exactly. So basically, it's them walking up, saying, "How dare you? I'm ready for a fight if the, if they're about to knock." If, 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 uh, that's the that it that is the mood that they're in. And so by having a chip on your shoulder, basically you are ready at a moment's notice to have a fight with someone, and you've sort of presented yourself as ready to have that fight. Hence, like, yeah. oh, that person's got a chip on their shoulder. That's where it kind of comes from. Like, oh, I would have never assumed. But the woodchuck is not that. So, yeah. so that it is literally chucking wood. And so in, in the air. So can't so how much wood could it chuck and could chuck wood? Now, how much is a tricky thing because like Given enough time, I imagine a woodchuck or a groundhog could, you know, chuck as much. If it could do any woodchucking, it could do as much as it could in its little lifespan. So I've seen estimates from Cornell University who have said that in the, over the lifetime of a woodchuck, if it were like a beaver, then it would create 400 pound dams of wood or something. And typically, OK, well, to me, that's not as interesting. It's not chucking. There's no chucking involved in that. That is all about uh, a gathering and assembling wood. So. That got me thinking, so what does it mean to chuck wood? So that must mean that it would have to be able to launch a piece of wood some considerable distance or height mm -hmm. in order to consider it chucked. So at that point, you're probably talking about a weight of wood that it would be able to chuck. So at this point, you're talking about pounds of wood, which would then equate to some kind of volume. So I tried to do some biomechanical analyses of, of wood chucks uh, to see what I could come up with. Uh, for this estimate. So how could I determine how high if a woodchuck could chuck wood, meaning that if it could hold a little log and its little tiny groundhog hands, would it be yeah. able to throw it? And I mean, you think it would throw it with its hands and not its mouth? Yeah, you know, well, you know, you know, I didn't think it's through the mouth. I think that I I would think you'd have more uh, a capacity to do, to do high power maneuvers with your arms. And because you because in order to throw something, you can't you don't just need strength like clenching your jaw. Or yeah. your neck, you're throwing. The neck is not a great thing for like maybe necessarily doing high power maneuvers. Maybe for quadrupeds, like dogs have to do it. But um, let's just assume the arms because I can get some kind of an es estimate for that. So mm -hmm. what I tried to do is to equate it to groundhog locomotion and how fast that they can, how much power can they get from running? Because they're running on all fours. And they can run pretty quick, apparently up to about 10 miles an hour. And, uh, and they can accelerate to that in a couple of seconds. And I was using this to come up with some rudimentary power estimates for how much power it could it can deliver in one stroke of its forearms or the, sorry, its front legs, I should say. Mm -hmm. And 
And based on that, I did a little bit of an energy analysis for how hot, for, for throwing a piece of wood to a certain height. Okay. okay. And using okay. that energetics analysis, and I assumed that, Hey, if it can toss a piece of wood above its head, roughly the height of its own body, I would consider that chucking. I had to okay. draw the line somewhere because if it's any kind of chuck, then any little bit of sounds like a chuck to me. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That's, that's where I go with a, sort of as a chuck. And so based upon that rudimentary analysis, me watching a few videos of wood chucks accelerating from rest to a running speed, I roughly estimated the amount of power that they could output in, or I should say the energy that it could produce into its gate as a, uh, from a single thrust of its four legs as to be a couple of joules of energy, G O U L E S, not the thing that the not FDA is saying. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, uh, so yeah, joules is a unit of energy. And, um, and so a couple of joules of energy would lead to the fact that it could toss something equivalent of a couple of pounds in the air uh, above its head uh, to, to the height of itself. So a couple of pounds of wood. I didn't get to the volumetric analysis as to how much wood that would be in terms of volume, yeah. but a couple of pounds by my definition. So, Thank you for uh, following me on that tangent, Rob. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so, in the meantime, uh, until we get the, uh, the uh, fusion reactor going, yeah. um, could, could we potentially uh, get a factory of wood chucks uh, generating joules of electricity? I imagine they would eat the thing. <laughs> attempt to. So they they'd find the wires if they're anything like my dog when he was a when he was a pup they would find all the wires and and uh that'd be a bunch of plasma just spilling everywhere okay um i did couldn't help but notice as you were yeah. talking that your name christian hubicki as an anagram would have the word chuck uh prominently um as a anagram uh Air Chuck inhibits is Christian You're Hibiki. Looking. Air Chuck inhibits. So basically <laughs> that I would be the inhibitor of Chuck. Or inhibits wood. Air Chuck. Yeah. 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 And so, but the point would be if you put this in some order that if there was some desire of wood chucks to chuck things in the air, I'd be inhibiting that. And I would yeah. be their nemesis. And, or, and maybe the, the surface tension, maybe the air inhibits the chuck yeah so oh oh the, you're talking about air resistance right yes, yes. Uh, now now that's a nice thought but this alternate universe christian ubiqui is an anagram doesn't know that air resistance would be pretty negligible in this particular mm -hmm. context but uh but it's a good thought we're close we're close to something rob i bet a couple more we workshop we would shop we would chuck shop that idea a little longer. <laughs> would shop, yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out yeah okay Christian, do you have a favorite goofy story from Survivor? That's on the mind of Luke L. Luke L. So, and, by, and Nathan in, in the chat uh, says that that's a great segue to talk about the uh, Timber Tina podcast uh, from the Ooh. last Talking with T Bird. Uh, that I've been that? Uh, really, I, I strongly recommend uh, one one of the best uh, Talking with T Birds uh, that there is, and she could chuck a lot of wood. I that does not surprise me. I I'll, she can, I'll, I'll, and she does. I remember vividly when we were listening to the Evolution of Strategy podcast of yours, uh, the audiobook, that that you thought that she was the kind of player that had given a proper chance and not stuck on a try before with Sari Fields, yes. one of the greatest players of all time, could have done amazingly well. I think so. I, I, I honestly, I, I don't know if she would have ever won a game of Survivor, but I, but I felt like that she had like Rupert upside of being uh, just an uh, iconic character that America would have just fallen in love with. Oh, that's a. Uh, it, it, it would have. We're kind of robbed of that. I mean, yes. I mean she was sort of outshined. I mean, the the, the, unfor the unfortunate thing for her, but fortunate thing for us is that that's Survivor Panama. That has some great cast members mm -hmm. all cloistered together on a single tribe. So that's a lot of wattage. So we probably did not notice as a general audience how much we would have missed because that season otherwise was still pretty great. So mm -hmm. uh, she, you know, in your Survivor first boot, this mythical Survivor first boot season. I would have would love to see how she does. She's a great character. Yeah, that's great. And uh, yeah, so and um, when it comes to, to to goofy to goofy stories, I I swear I had a, a story in mind because I was reviewing the questions beforehand. I saw I kind of spitball a few that were were kind of were, were kind of amusing. I, I definitely 
Uh, One thing I talked about with Dalton Ross one time, and I'll talk about another story that's probably an exclusive here as well. But was 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 uh, but was when I in the pregame Ponderosa um, that I was so nervous um, in the pregame Ponderosa. I was so scared because you're sitting around. You're not allowed to talk to anyone. Everyone's judging you. And you got to understand from my perspective, like I'm first boot material. Like I just, it's just like, I'm the, I'm the weird wimpy nerd. You know, I'd say the wrong thing. I could be an easy pick off and that's my attitude going into this game. And so I'm doing my level best to just try to stay calm, even though I'm incredibly nervous. So I'm using my Sudoku cipher to, which I had mentioned on previous podcasts to encode my notes in the, uh, in, in the, in my, uh, of my contestant, fellow contestants in code, uh, while also still correctly doing Sudoku, this is trying to occupy my mind from d- just anything from having to worry about the game. Just, just writing down like five letter words in the cipher was just incredibly uh, um, time intensive and thought intensive. But it, the nice thing was it looks like I was concentrating very hard on the Sudoku yeah. uh, to the outside world. Were you, were you concerned that people would see your notes? Is that why you had to encode them? Because I feel like that doing the uh, Sudoku is probably, I feel like, uh, maybe more of a red flag uh, than just writing. Well, I mean, so you got, from my perspective, I was not worried. I mean, I, I think that people who watch the season now, they, 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 they say, like, Christian, you are this massive threat. Why would you do anything that looks at all threatening? Why would you talk about sli- uh, Sudokus or sly puzzles? It's like That was not my perspective going into this game. My perspective is, why the hell would they keep me around one vote? Right. Why wouldn't they just get rid of me immediately? And um, and so all of like that was a signal to my tribe. It's like, hey, I might be useful. I in have the value. Puzzles. Yeah. I have value. And so it, I mean, and, and I and so the idea. If you had told me going to that game, Christian, what people will say about you is that you were way too threatening. I would have laughed in your face. Like mm-hmm. there's like that was not on my radar. I'm not. I, I I don't see myself as a threatening person, and I don't see how that would have been. I mean, I mean also like like you're there also with incredibly charming people. Like some of those people on that season are the most charming human beings I have ever met in my life. Alec Merlino is preternaturally charming when you're around him. Oh my god. Kara Kay is like oh I remember one time I was hanging out with Alec and we were out we were out we were out in the, out in the ocean we were on a vacation together actually. And and he spontaneously started riffing as though he were a SeaWorld whale trainer or sea, or SeaWorld trainer. He's like, "Hey everybody, we're here for the we're, we're here for the show today." And he does this whole bit and Kara jumps in the water and pretends to be a seal. I'm like, these people are like almost improv comics. Like it was, it was, it was a, these are the people I expected to be around and they didn't. Goliaths. Yeah, they are Goliaths. Am I right? They, yeah. Yeah. And Mike White's seal impression was very good. I have to say, I got to give him credit. Uh, but like, these are the people I'm around. And so the idea that like, this was that, a, that me doing a, a Sudoku was threatening is hilarious because lots of people do Sudoku. In fact, I was, the only reason I was almost found out for my uh, Sudoku cipher was Natalia from the Goliath tribe, she, as I suspected, walked past my my table. I, by the way, I would leave my Sudoku book open when I went to the bathroom because there was nothing to hide from my perspective, right? So I left it open. All the answers were correct. So the numbers weren't random numbers. Um, but Natalia went by and looked while I was in the bathroom, looked at my Sudoku book. And so like, and she does a lot of Sudoku. And she's like, some of these answers he should obviously get much faster than he's getting. These are some obvious answers he's missing. That should be a three. That should be a seven. Yeah, he must not be that good at Sudoku, is what she it's what, it's what she thought. And she and there was a time where we were taken uh, uh, one at a time to go meet the producers before the show starts. Yeah. And I, I by that point, I talked with some of the producers who were hanging around. It's like, yeah, I'm doing the Sudoku cipher. And they were just laughing their asses off because they're like, this is hilarious because they didn't know I was doing a, a code book. And, um, and, so the word had gotten out around production that Christian is doing this weird math uh, Sudoku cipher. And Natalia later tells me that she went to go meet the producers in the one-on-one interviews. And she's like, yeah, I wanted to work with that, that, that nerdy guy, but he's really bad at Sudoku. I don't, I I looked at his book. It's terrible. And apparently according to her, all the producers were stifling their laughter and they and you know, and she had no idea why. So months later, after I talked with her, I was like, well, that's why. 
because they all knew about Sudoku Cipher. Um, that's half the story. Um, but it's a so like I'm trying to keep calm doing the Sudoku Cipher, and like it only works for a little while. And so I decided I'm going to go take a walk. In fact, I go see Carl loves to hang out on the pier. Uh, there was another another contestant out in the pier as well, and it's like you know, I'm, you know, they're they're hanging out, dangling their feet over the wa- water. That's cool. All right, I, so I go. I'm going to do the same thing. So it's, when there's no one else out there, I go walk out, walk off. You know, go look at the fish in the water. Put you know, I sit down at the edge of the pier, dangling my feet over the edge, knowing I have sandals on. And I'm like, I will not drop my sandals in the water. I'm just going to look at the ocean. I'm not going to drop my sandals in. I'm good. I go to go get up to leave, and my sandal ki- catches the edge of the pier, plops right in the water. I'm like, damn it, damn it. My p- sandal is in the water, and the pier is approximately 200 feet offshore. I verified this on Google Earth months later. And so and I, my sandal's there, floating. Yeah. Everyone can kind of see it if, if they're looking out. There's a sandal out there, and I need that sandal. You're not allowed to go and swim in the ocean. How am I going to go get this? So I was like, all right. So I walk back to the edge of the, to, the, to, the, to the base of the pier, grab a producer. And I said, hey, you know, I'll, I dropped my sandal out there. Can I just wade in real quick and go get it? And I think they had no idea the, 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 the depth of what I was asking to do. And they said, oh, yeah, sure. And so I go and I start to wade into the water underneath the pier. So hopefully no one can see me. And uh, I was like, I'm just going to wade in real quick. I'm going to go and get the sandal. And I realized that the water is not is the base the the bottom of the of the of of the of the of the water the shore is not just like flat sand it's like loose rocks that are like the size of like baseballs but okay. oddly shaped so every single step there's no proper foothold and the rocks shift between your feet as soon as you step on it so beneath the surface i'm desperately trying to keep my balance above the surface i'm tripping from step to step to step out 200 feet to get my my then floating, uh, my floating sandal. Uh, and so I trip my way out there. And by that point, one of the producers notices what I'm up to and wa- walks up on the pier above me and says, okay, yeah, let's come back to shore, Christian. It's like, okay. Or CH, I think they call me mm-hmm. CH then. Yeah, CH. Uh, and, 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 uh, and, yeah. Yeah, and so, yeah, Chuck, yeah. And so I, and I'm, and I'm stumbling back to shore. Every step was an individual indignity, Rob. Every single step was its own flavor of embarrassment in the way that you could follow backward, forward, left, right, in, out. And I get back to shore. I'm like, okay, at least I'm under the pier. Hopefully people can't see me. Everyone sees me. Everyone is looking at me, staring at me. I'm like, I am dead. I am as if I needed more things to be worried about going into the game. And I talk to the producer. I say, I, I'm a little worried what these people think of me right now. And he's like, ah, Christian or CH, it's fine. You know, they'll forget this all before, by the time they reach the island, that's okay. And, uh, and then so fast forward, go through the game, crazy stuff happens. I'm over a month later, I'm back in Ponderosa and uh, I meet that same producer happens to be back at Ponderosa. And it's like, yeah, he's like, yeah, Christian, you know, when you did that sandal thing, I thought you were screwed. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm glad you made it. <laughs> it's, it's like, I'm glad you made it, but I thought you were screwed. Um, yeah, that, yeah. that was, that was a goofy story from before the game started. Did it have any impact in your mind of how people perceived you? Because then also, you know, when that game starts, you know, instantly yeah. you're sort of like thrust into uh, the yeah. spotlight. Or do you feel like that maybe like being in the spotlight at the start, maybe people forgot all about the sandal, uh, you know, five minutes into the game? Well, less important than what they forgot, I didn't forget. So I already thought I was in a deficit going into this game. So I better smoke this puzzle. And demonstrate mm-hmm. my value because I'm already the the, the the doofus who lost a sandal in the ocean. Natalia right? thinks and, uh, I can't even do Sudoku. It, yeah, exactly. So like this is, this is like basically all compounded. And so like I better demonstrate value, which is now so funny because now people would tell me like, oh Christian, why were you so threatening out there? Like I don't know what you know. I got, I didn't want to be voted out first. Thank mm-hmm. you. Um, but yeah, and that's that was a fun goofy story. And uh, and and I'm sure there are others. Maybe we can sprinkle them in throughout the podcast. Okay. I did see, I do see I do see in the chat. I do see um I'm not sure how to pronounce this, but Omer Zahir. Is that mm-hmm. how it's pronounced? I see. Yeah. So I see a question. I see a question. The question is from Omer Zahir. That's a great name. That's a good survivor name. This person should apply. Uh, mm. what is your favorite bird and which bird would you want to make into a robot? That is a great question. So 
I wish I could call myself a bird expert, but I know I definitely am not. Uh, the I, I have the good fortune of working with a biomechanist who specializes in birds, particularly a, a bird I've grown fond of, uh, the guinea fowl. The guinea fowl. Um, so I have a colleague by the name of Dr. Monica Daly at the UC, University of California at Irvine, and she studies a lot of the biomechanics of a lot of animals, including humans. But I think one of her signature studies was on how guinea fowl run. And for those who know what a guinea fowl is, it's basically a little chicken sized bird. They, there are a lot of them in South Africa, but they're also around the United States. They're actually around here in, uh, in rural Florida as well. People have them on farms. People eat them. Um, they kind of have this, they, they almost look like kind of sort of like little chicken sized turkeys. Sometimes they have an odd complexion to them where their face is white. And they'll have a little red, little gizzardy thing, and I'm sure uh, uh, Dr. Zahir would know the actual term for it. Um, but but what they are also they're incredibly agile little runners. And my my colleague, you know, years before I met her, had done a study for her PhD where she would take a guinea fowl and then she would construct a little runway for the guinea fowl. So imagine two uh, two like fences going this way, like a fence on either side, and it's a little runway it's gonna run along, okay? And you can put the bird in the runway, you give it a little clap, 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 go, and the thing would just take off and dart down the runway. It's kind of adorable. And she would take these high speed motion capture videos of it. She would put force plates in the floor, which are basically high-tech bathroom scales that measure weights every fraction of a second. So you get mm -hmm. the forces of this of the bird interacting with the ground. And then takes off fast as hell, this little bird. Um, then what she would do is she would take the runway and then secretly remove one of the pieces of the runway, sort of like, like one square of it, like one tile. And so there's a little pothole in the middle. And then she would cover up the pothole with a piece of tissue paper so the bird couldn't see it. And the bird would run down the runway. It would step on the tissue paper, step straight through it, and keep going. And the pothole would be up to the equivalent of like our knee, like halfway up our leg would be the equivalent of up this of up this bird, half the bird's leg. And the bird, it's like nothing, almost nothing even happened to the bird. And it's not flying. It's not doing anything crazy like flapping its wings to maintain its trajectory. What she determined is through, through analysis, not just with this bird, but using these simulations, these imperfect models that are useful, particularly this little pogo stick, this little pogo stick simulation, that the bird was, was moving its leg in such a way that in spite of whenever that leg would hit the ground, it would hit the ground at a point that would help its locomotion continue to move forward. So it's a very specific way in which it swings its leg backward as it's, um, as it's about to hit the ground. It was minimally affected, or I would say not very affected by the fact that it was a giant pothole in the way. So this... And I got to run a few of these experiments myself uh, with different way. I, I help birds run over sand, and uh, it, with that, my, so I've had some experiment experience with getting with motivating birds to run, I, which can be a creative process. You know, you want you you want the bird to to like you and trust you, but at the same time, you just want to tell them it's time to run. So sometimes you'll clap at them like go go go. Sometimes I would grab I would grab like a box of like nails from a hardware store and then shake it so it makes a weird sound so it would run away uh, we found that the birds don't like to be near crinkling plastic bags for a little while and in order to just motivate them to run down this runway so at that time has given me some affinity for these cute little guinea fowl um guinea fowl see guinea that's fowl. not what i thought you were going to say i thought that maybe you were going to say the chicken has flown the coop the chicken <laughs> has flown the coop Oh, you, you, you! Thank you for waiting long enough to, that long to to deploy that clip. I know you must have been ready on ready on the ready on the trigger for all that time, <laughs> and uh, and and someone like Omer, who uh, who those know from the, the wonderful player from from this past season, um, and the he, I, I saw on Twitter he had tricks for how to feed birds. I think he or how to pill a chicken. I think I saw a video where in order to put a pill in a chicken's mouth, he would do this kind of hooking maneuver where he would uh, put a pill on his finger and then force it down sort of the, the chicken the chicken's cheek so that it will kind of then swallow it, which I think he demonstrated on Lydia Meredith. Uh, 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 there's a video online. Is that true? I think that, yeah, you can find it online. Oh, my God. Um, 
yeah so it's a, it's kind of it's kind of it's kind of funny um but uh the so like i like you learn there are lots of little things you you know and, and how, how to and how to thoughtfully um get these birds to to run uh you, you also have to learn how to weigh the birds which is tough because work birds won't stand still on a bathroom scale and I learned things like, you know, you, you kind of just, you cover their eyes, you cover their, cover their head with a little, with a little baggie, with a little, with a little black cloth and they think it's nighttime and then they become very docile and you can weigh them. And so they're kind mm -hmm. of adorable, you know, it's, uh, once you get to know them. Okay. Christian, then why don't we take this question, um, from a, uh, mutual friend. Davy Rickenbacker wants to know: Are you excited for the I Am Legend sequel? Um, and uh, Davy says, considering if it's still happening, given uh, the slap, but we're supposed to be starting uh, Will Smith and uh, Michael B. Jordan. Oh yeah! So I, I I saw this question from Davy. I couldn't I could not not include it, and uh, because not only uh, I know Davy's a big zombie guy. You know, yes. he loves The Walking Dead. And I Am Legend's kind of like, like a... Like Not a, just like The a, Walking Dead, but... You know, me being out here, I already feel like I'm a part of a, an apocalypse, which is my other dream. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you, so, yeah. Davey and I have a kinship over post-apocalyptic films. I'm not sure I actually ever put that to Davey exactly like that, but like, I think it's the reason why we, we both bond over the, the those those kinds of movies. And mm. he, he brought up on the island that he liked I Am Legend... But there was some kind of you know, that that Davy had had a conversation. I want to say with one of his relatives, maybe his brother, about the ending of the I Am Legend movie. Which, for those who don't know, is a bit of a famous controversy about the I Am Legend movie. That so a little, I'll give you a little bit of a plot synopsis and then a spoiler warning for I, I Am Legend. If you want to skip past I Am Legend this One, yes I, yes, I Am Legend One, to be clear, and they'll, they'll build to I Am Legend Two and why I'm somewhat excited about it. Somewhat excited in that the. Uh, I Am Legend 1 starts as a post-apocalypse where uh, a an alleged cure for cancer actually turns into some kind of crazy virus that turns people into sort of vampire zombies, more yeah. or less. I think in, yeah. the, in the book, in the original book, I think they're basically vampires. And these are sort of like, uh, these are kind of more zombie type vampires in the, in the movie. So they're kind of mindless. They can't really talk. You know, they're kind of, I believe in the book, they're actually like, talking creatures right um in the movie they're kind of like roaring zombies who are very strong who can't go out in the daylight so that's how they're kind of like vampires and will smith is one of the few people that's immune or the only to his knowledge the only person that's immune from this virus and basically he's a virologist or some kind of uh he's some kind of scientist that could is trying to cure the disease as one of the last people alive and um, and he basically has to survive while trying to gather enough resources in order to then cure the virus. And that's the synopsis of the movie. Now, the spoiler at the end is, is that near the end of the movie, um, as theatrically as theatrically released, um, he had been over the course of the movie remembering all of these uh, moments with his son, who is now deceased, presumably, uh, that. He, to remember the butterflies like hey do, hey hey will smith dad i love butterflies here look at the butterfly i'm making a butterfly hand gesture and it's just sort of this throwaway thing um but at the end of the movie will smith's hideout is found he's this high-tech hideout that he somehow managed to hide in the middle of new york city and the zombies have gotten in and will smith has put himself into um, it, um, into this hideout, into this sort of safe room with this zombie that he has captured that he's going to then experiment on to try to cure this zombie. And these other, this, 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 this big head honcho zombie along with a horde is basically ramming into this safe room and rams his head into the, into the glass. And all of a sudden, a butterfly crack forms in the glass, this butterfly crack, crack, crack pattern in the glass and will smith decides that this is the point that he has to sacrifice himself i think to save like two other people he found so he takes a grenade and just noble sacrifice and and uh and blows up the zombie so the others can escape okay 
That's the theatrical release movie. Have you, are you aware of this sort of controversy, Rob? Is this a thing you've heard of? You know what? It sounds vaguely uh, familiar. I remember yeah. seeing this movie in the movie theater, but um, I kind of think the, that what? I mean, this is what, 20 years ago? Uh, this this movie? 15 years ago. I'd say 2008, 2007. Roughly. 2007. Okay. 2007. Yeah. yeah I, I, and so, so, so 2007, it came out. And that was the theatrical release. It was kind of neither here nor there. So there's some kind of like guiding hand of higher power that's guiding. Uh, uh, Will Smith to sacrifice himself to take out the zombies. However, however, there is an alternate ending that, and here's yeah. the alternate ending, and it's filmed, and it was the way that it worked in the book, and it was way better in my yeah. opinion. Yeah, I, so, I feel like that there was like the DVD release, it was like, oh, you gotta see the other ending. Oh, the other ending is way, it is way better, and apparently, so, so in my opinion, and so same stuff happens, but at the end of the movie, Will Smith is he's, he's trapped in this panic room with this zombie that he's trying to cure, and and and, he, and there's this horde of zombies that are coming at him, and he and they're smashing into the glass, and he's like, "I'm trying to save her. I'm trying to save you all." And then he looks at the at at, at the zombie he has captive, and it's a woman who has a butterfly tattoo, and the zombie who's trying to get in stops pounding on the glass takes his hand smears in in the shape of in the shape on the glass the shape of a butterfly that he wants his mate back that he is an intelligent creature and you crazy will smith are abducting us trying to kill us and trying to turn us into something that we're not yeah like we just want our 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 citizen back we want our friend back i want my mate back and that's where Will Smith realizes, I, I'm the monster. I am the legend. I'm the one who is who who is kidnapping these poor citizens who didn't ask for this, who happen to be zombies, and I need to return them. So he opens up the panic door, returns the the the, the, the experimented zombie uh, that the, the woman that he was experimenting on, and they all leave. And he goes on his way, realizing that. He has to accept that whatever these people once were, they are something different now. And I was the monster for basically waging war on these people who just wanted to exist. So to me, that's much more thoughtful. But apparently test audiences hated it. And so mm -hmm. that's why they changed it in the focus group to that ending, which makes much more sense. The whole movie is sort of giving you dribbles and hints that these zombies are smarter and more aware than you're led to believe. And that's the payoff at the end that they are in their own society and just want to be left alone. Interesting. And what will the sequel be about? This is why I don't know. I mean, it's, yeah. it's all in development, I'm sure, at this point. Unless you know more, Davey. I look forward to, to chatting with you afterwards. But if it does something to correct, or if it's a remake or some kind of sequel or something that corrects what happened in that first movie to give us the right ending, I have hope for that. Retcon it? It could retcon it. I feel like if they're going to recast, if they're going to put in Michael B. Jordan or something, a different actor, um, you know, th then I think that there's a possibility. Like it's 15 years. That's enough time for a remake uh, uh, in respectful interval. Um, or maybe if it's a sequel, they can uh, have this new character be the one that has a revelation that should have happened in the first movie. Mm -hmm. That's much more interesting to have to accept this weird culture yeah. that of your former friends and family that they're, you know, you get it. Did so. Davey have a take on the endings? Did he agree oh, with you? So the funny thing we're talking with Davey, like I, I'll never forget this conversation was I, we were, we were hanging out in camp with like the, the, the I think the, I want to say the light was getting low at the end of the day. And there was, uh, um, and we were talking, they talk about the movie I Am Legend. And he mentioned something about the ending being weird, that he and his brother were talking about it, that it was like, it didn't make sense to him. And I was like, well, Davey, did you know this is the ending? And I, the alternate ending? I explained it to him. And his eyes were the size of saucers. And he's like, what? And so it was just this revelation that it all makes sense now. And so like, it's it was it was just a cathartic moment in the middle of what was, I want to say, well into the merge, which is otherwise a crazy strategic time that we were talking about. I am legend. And I'll never forget that, 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 that moment of levity and realization on his mm -hmm. face. Okay. Christian, how about this question from an anonymous listener? Yeah. Do you have any tips on how to be a better communicator? Oh, uh, so yes. 
I do have tips. And this is something I think about a lot because I love to communicate science. And it's kind of one of those topics that can get notoriously boring and be yes. hard to and, and, and hard to get people's attention or hard mm -hmm. to get across because it requires sometimes requires a lot of background material. But you have to be clever and creative and you can find ways to get it across to people. At least that's what I've found. I think that's what other people have found. Yes. And I, and I know you, uh, I heard you recently talk about this when you were on the post-show recap for mm -hmm. uh, Better Call Saul and uh, you had uh, an amazing three-hour uh, appearance uh, in the off-season uh, with Josh and Antonio. And mm -hmm. you talked about one of the things you like about the show is that they can take something that would be seemingly uninteresting, sort of like these legal proceedings, mm -hmm. and their job is to sort of like make it interesting and you have to often come at what you're talking about in the same way. How, how do I make something that might, you know, that could be boring and how do I make it very interesting? Yeah. And I think that's a classic conundrum. And I, I and I see a lot of science communicators on Twitter, they're, you know, they're, and there they're are now a lot of TikTok science communicators. Someday I'll have to get on the TikTok science communication game, maybe after they give me tenure, but the, uh, hopefully they'll do that. And so uh, if you're listening tenure committee, you give me tenure, you get tech talks, you know, that's your incentive. Uh, but, uh, but the, the, and so when it comes to, but I see a lot of the advice that people give can be very specific, but it all comes down to the same thing. Rule number one is to know your audience. That's the first rule of communication. Who are you talking to? And that will tell you a lot about how you should be communicating because that gives you all of the information that you need. Uh, that, that's important information to know what their background is. So that way you're starting from a common point of understanding. And it also tells you what vocabulary you can use. Uh, one thing I, I detest about sometimes people do when it comes to science communication is sometimes you can tell the person just wants to show off how smart they seem to think they are. That's a tough, I mean, that I, I, I think the best science communicators don't do that. Mm -hmm. I think, but the, but the, uh, uh, but some of these people are just trying to tell you about some topic like, oh, I do flippity flop and the googly goo. I'm like, well, that means nothing to me because I don't know what a flippity flop or a googly goo is. And that, to, and then it's no necessarily more complex than if I were talking to, instead of a scientist, like a hairstylist, mm -hmm. a hairstylist could use all kinds of terminology about hairstyles. I would have no idea what the heck they're talking about. So like, like, so, so, it, and so I don't care what field it is. Having a common point of understanding is definitely the first start. And when you think about it from that standpoint, you say, if you know your audience, you can think about uh, what are the things that they know. Like if someone's trying to explain to me about hairstyling, which I know nothing about, they should probably, they wouldn't use terms that I've never heard of. They would, you know, try, you know, they would, they would say, oh, this kind of cut is when you take the scissors and you try to, we give, we call it, we, we call it layers because we take a little bit of a layer from one hair and do that, a little bit of layer from that. And what it does is this, they could explain that, right? And that's what I know. That's my common knowledge. Mm -hmm. It also tells you something about the, maybe the, the, the background or maybe sometimes the age of the people, you know, I, I, my, the first and almost only thing I need to know when I'm giving a talk, the science talk to people is what age range am I talking? What si and what back and what class background am I talking? Like uh, talking to, um, am I talking to, to, to am I, am I talking to 12th graders? Am I talking to fourth graders? Am I talking to adults who, who have, who, who have taken engineering courses, adults who are adults who have not, but just want to learn. Right. And so th that's number one, the almost the only thing I need to know, like then also how long am I allowed to talk? That's, mm -hmm. that's like, that's like number two, but that second one is much more fungible than the first one. No one's going to want to hear me talk if I, uh, about, about uh, nonlinear control theory, if I haven't defined any of those terms for them or why it would matter for their lives. And that's the last thing is that when you know more about your audience, you might know what matters to them. I know there are some people who I can just go off on some puzzle, some mathematical puzzle about, oh, this is so interesting. But if I talk to the raw, to a different group of people, they might not. Uh, be in the same place where they want to appreciate the puzzle, they might just go to like, okay, but how's this help me? What's the application? A lot of times the question is like, all right, but well, what's the application of this? And I'm like, oh, okay. I need to back up and tell them why it's useful to their lives. Then they might care more as to this, why this puzzle is preventing this thing from penetrating their lives. So number one, across the board is know your audience. And the more you empathize with that audience, the better communicator you're going to be, science or otherwise. 
you t- mentioned that your audience uh, might be fourth graders. H- have you ever done a, a speaking in front of uh, children? Yeah, definitely have. Uh, I, the, yeah. How does that go? Pretty good. Pretty good. Like I, I am very fortunate in the world of robotics where my talks can have lots of videos, lots of present, lots of in like videos with stuff happening in it. And like, I'll have a video that, that my students generated in the lab where we'll have a little drone and I will, I, I set up the camera. So that way the, the, the drone is out of the frame. Then all of a sudden a little drone just pops up into the frame mm-hmm. and then out of nowhere, this almost this black blur, which is like a, which is a pendulum that's swinging, this swings through the frame. And then the, the drone just dodges straight toward the camera and, and, and avoids it. Right. Mm-hmm. So there's moments of impact that I can do in my, in, cause I, in my particular field of robotics, Oh, here's a robot doing a cool thing. And that can engage them long enough to say, well, you know, it, it's like, you know, you are taking, you know, you're learning your times tables. Well, this robot is basically doing its times tables a thousand times a second in order to do that little maneuver that you saw. Right. Mm-hmm. So that's so that's how you would wrap in that audience. Uh, and, you know, as opposed to a, a technical audience, which I can just talk about, it's like, well, we certainly all agree about the importance of learning novel failures in robotic systems. Right. Yeah, we all agree on that. And then go from there. OK. Christian, how about um, a question from Sarah S. Who says, uh, mm-hmm. hi, Christian. I'm a huge fan of yours from Survivor. And I was wondering if you could talk a little about how you made an audition tape. Well, well, first off, hello, back right right, right back at you, Sarah. I have made Have we talked about this before? You know, we honestly haven't. We talked a little bit about my process for getting on the show. I think back Mm -hmm. when I did my deep dive uh, back in the day. And back when you were in Los Angeles, it feels like a forever ago now. We did it in person. Yeah, one, was, one of the that, few that I've done uh, in in the same room as the person. I'll never forget that. That was so much fun going through all that. And the I talked about the general process, and it was a I, real thrill for me, also. By the way, oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, and 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 uh, the my so I had applied. I explained that I had applied during graduate school, which for me was sort of the years like 2011 through like 2014 were the years I was applying when I was a PhD student. That's when I decided that, hey, I waited long enough. I should probably start applying. And I never heard anything back. And when I, and I made videos for all those times. And the first time, I, I think I mentioned to you, I, I had a flip camera video uh, that I had bought on a whim to try to make my to make my video. And then I burned it on a DVD and shipped it in the mail. Mm-hmm. And then the year after that, they started the online submission. Yeah. Yeah, so how quaint back in then, right? Mm-hmm. And I, I'm sure I have that flipped camera somewhere. But what I did for my videos, which were not uh, to my, <laughs> it's not uh, viewed positively by casting. I, uh, I, I didn't really talk much about, uh, like I, I tried to, I tried to just talk, generally about why I, I like the show, I guess. It's like, oh yeah, I like the show. I, I like Richard Hatch and and I, I, wor- I work in robotics, you know, and I didn't and I didn't really sell the robotic side of thing. Like I didn't have a video of me with a robot, for instance. Like I should have mm-hmm. just done that. But like but I didn't. I sort of sort of dryly explained what I did. And in my head, I I envisioned casting producers or what I didn't know what they were called at the time, these mythical people I knew nothing about. Well, whoever's watching this, there are some kind of intuitive genius that will know just from looking at me or just from thing I say whether or not I would be good on the show. And that was entirely wrong. I didn't real and it took me years to realize I had to be a salesman. I had to be a salesman, a salesperson for myself. I had to sell that I was a person. And that's something I was learning in academia as a graduate student a lot, that I had to go to these conferences, give presentations. And it's not enough to just say, here are my results. This is, and this is why it's good. You got to sell and get people excited because they probably watched 30 other presentations that day. And the more exciting it is, the more likely they are to remember the thing that you did and then actually go and read what you did as a consequence. And, and so, so, um, so eventually what, so I, I, I applied for like three years in a row, effectively the same tape, not really too much, any different heard nothing back and it took a few years off for a couple of reasons uh, that I thought had to do with work. And so then eventually I then moved from a PhD to my postdoc. I was at Georgia tech and I thought, and I, I, I told you the story I was listening to first one out 
and I was listening to Ryan Ulrich give an interview to Josh Winkler about how he had applied many times, heard nothing back, and but this one time he applied, heard back immediately, and got on the show. And that that told me that like oh maybe because I, I just assumed that they just looked at my tape and they just looked at me and they saw in my eyes I am not good TV mm-hmm. and I should not be on the show. And I so what's the point? They've already decided. Uh, but then it's like, oh, I'll try again. And that by then, I, my salesmanship skills were a lot better. So I decided to make a video. So what I did for my video is I was terrified to let, ask anyone else to help me. So I, I had nobody help me with my video because that is incredibly embarrassing for me to ask people to help me with my Survivor audition video in the Georgia Tech Physics Department where I was working at the time. That was very embarrassing. I think in hindsight, they would have definitely helped me. Uh, mm-hmm. But uh um, but I, so in the middle of the night, I went to the physics library, it was like the physics, like where there was a chalkboard and I wrote some equations on the chalkboard that were relevant to robotics in my, in my field, including the little pogo stick, uh, model. I, I drew it up on the board and sat down with my laptop and I did about four hours worth of takes of my video yeah. and I, and just, and I, in my mind, I was like, I need to get this exactly. And I, and I, I went off and I did some good, you know, I, I, I knew how to start the video. Like I wore the robot shirt in my video and I said, hi, I'm Christian Yubicki. I'm a robotics research scientist and I want to be on Survivor. And that's what I did. And it was very clear from a branding standpoint, this was me. I was wearing the robot shirt and then I cut immediately to a video of me with a robot like a walking yeah. robot the size of a person you know i work with robots the size of the, the, that, that walk around with two legs that they're that are the size of people basically science fiction robots that's what i do and then i went on to talk about the show i went, I went on to talk about uh you know other things that about me um and that that that's cool and i sent that in uh um um i edited it together all that footage and I submitted to the, and I remember submitting it on in the online form. And the next morning I woke up, it was like a Sunday I submitted it. And the next morning on a Monday, I woke up and I was like, so depressed about it. It's like, you know what? That's not going anywhere. I wonder if I should like reach out to like Rob or Steven or something like that and get advice mm-hmm. on my video. Mm-hmm. There's no way that's going anywhere. And then a couple hours later, I get a call uh, that day from, from, from a casting producer. So like, and I, I'll never forget. I was I was about to walk my dog Fermi. I was about to, I was walking outside of my apartment, and I was about to go on a walk. And I opened up my phone and I got a phone, and it was a Los Angeles area code. I'm like, this is yeah. probably something I should be taking. So I I, I pick up the phone, and they, they they introduce themselves as a casting producer from Survivor. I said, can can I can you give me like five seconds? Meanwhile, I was like 15 seconds or 30 seconds away from my door of my apartment. So I literally like I literally am rushing back to my apartment because I do not want to miss this call. I'm running. I'm like uh, five, four. I'm counting down to make sure yeah, that yeah, you know, yeah. I hung up the phone. And I get back into the room, and Emily's very confused. And eventually, put, she puts together. I'm talking to this casting producer, and. And the long and the short of it is they said that, uh, uh, you know, I like your video. I want to pitch you to my boss. And, uh, you know, I love the first, like, five seconds of your video. I want to, re- I want you to remake the rest of it. Uh, oh, so- interesting. <laughs> it's like, I can't really work with the rest of it. That's not interesting to my, to, to, uh, from, from, a, from a casting perspective. You know, you talk about all these other things, you know. And, and, and so, you, for instance, I didn't even talk about Survivor. I for in my right. in my head in my head I'd heard all kinds of terrible casting advice over the years. Like people say they don't care if you're a fan of the show or not, and I'm like, oh, I interpreted it as, oh, therefore I shouldn't talk about the show. I should only talk about myself. So mm-hmm. I did. So um, and they gave me advice saying, you know, also you seemed a little stiff in the video, which was true. I did about four hours of takes of me doing of saying things over and over again, and they're like, ah, oh, you know, so loosen up a bit. So uh, and redo the video. I was like, okay. So I did that, and I so I I, I um so I needed to find another time to go back, uh, and I had like and I there was, uh, I applied right at the end of the casting cycle, so they needed all my materials like right now. So like I uh, went and um in the the very very early morning, I think like like four a.m. when the gas station across the street uh, opened up, I needed something to loosen me up, so I bought a six six pack of IPAs, and <laughs> okay, and um and I. Uh, I went to the physics library long before it was open 
and started drinking some IPA, started to do some takes, tried to, and it wasn't working. I was too nervous. I ended up walking around campus a little bit buzzed, you know, tried to do takes on my phone and nothing was working all day. Like I'm trying to come up with takes. Eventually I take a break because I'm going to come back at night. So I come back at like 11 at night. I do another four hours of takes and I, and I was so loopy and tired that I was much more natural apparently. And I cut together another video and they're like, that's great. That's what yeah. we needed. Like, uh, so, so that's, that was so, and, but I think the, the, what I, what I had taken away from the experience is that I should be telling stories about myself that, both tell me, tell them who I am and why I'd be good on the show. Yeah. Tell stories. I mean, there, cause that hits three, that, that has three elements. One, it's character building to know who you are. Two, they know why you'd be on the show. And most importantly, how good of a storyteller are you? You yeah. were put on there to tell the story of the show, show that in your audition video. That's what I should have told myself years ago. Yeah. Because basically your audition tape is sort of like the pilot for you know uh you on the show basically like in confessional so they're looking for people that are going to be like good you know uh good characters that they want to see more talking to the camera i i think the thing about your story that i think that people should also take away from is like you did not have to have it perfect on the first try and like uh think of i think it's more like online dating than like okay the, the basically like it's going to be like uh a film festival where it's like oh okay uh overall thumbs down on this one it's like that's interesting all right let's call that guy let's see yeah. let's see what he has and so exactly so yeah. It's like, so, yeah. yeah like okay sure let's you know let's see if he has anything i i think they're going to you know turn every single stone uh, as opposed to just like, you know, watch your video and then, you know, give you the thumbs down. Right. And that casting producer thought I, I had potential based upon those first five yeah. seconds of my video. Right. And um, and which was a surprise to me, because honestly, I, I, I like the fact that I got a call back at all was hilarious. I'm like, I can't believe they're actually going to want to put me on the show. And and, and, and I think that an a, a evolution of my understanding about casting works is that when I applied years ago, I had no idea how most people viewed the show. I viewed it as this game show. And it is a game show, but a reality show has a story component. So to me, it was no different than if I were applying for Jeopardy. You know, there are some aspects of do they do they test well on camera on Jeopardy, but really they just want to there's some there's some base level. You have to be good at question and answer and the actual game of Jeopardy before they put you on the show. And that's not what reality casting is for the most part. I mean, it's you're you're they're they are telling a story that happens to be framed around an interesting game. And so and so when I started realizing that, oh, I they are looking for what are effectively television characters, which seems like such an obvious thing yeah. now, right? But like at the time it was a revelation to me. It's like well, they're not just like casting random dude or woman from part of the country with this background. That's it. Okay, no, right. No. Jeopardy doesn't cast a person as like a uh, boy, like uh, this person is going to be terrible at Jeopardy, right. but they'll exactly. be fun. Right. Exactly. You know, I, I, that's something I didn't understand as like, yeah. I mean, just appreciating it as like a graduate student, just watching the show on my own. But when I like started listening to like evolution or strategy, or when I listened to your podcast, like when you did, had, the, had the, had the wiggle room where Josh would talk about the story of survivor it's weird, but it was me hearing for the first time that, Oh, this is a story not just a mechanism for which to deliver a million dollars to a, to a normal American. Right. And, and so and not, it, there is a game. It's an important game, an interesting game. There's one I, that's why I cared to go, but that, but that's ultimately what it, what it does. And, I, and just to reemphasize your point about not getting, for, getting it perfect on the first try. I didn't get it perfect on the second try either in the sense that the reason I did four hours of takes is because I assumed that I could not say the word um at any point in my video. If I did, I would be toast. Like they, like I cannot do. I, everything has to be perfectly polished. I should be like a news anchor who is able to deliver the news, like a Rick Devins, and just go and, and go for it, right? And so I did so many takes and made sure there were no ums whatsoever. So at at that point, I get you know it's it's not a secret. At some point, if you get far enough in the process, you go out for interviews. You get interviewed. In person, right? I won't go into a lot of details there because I'm sure they love to keep some secrets about how they go about the casting process. But you get interviewed, and and I remember being so tickled that they actually flew me. We're gonna fly me out for interview. I I remember Emily and I. I just got a celebratory dinner. It's like I cannot believe 
that I'm actually going to go and fly out to Los Angeles to interview Survivor. That's crazy. I had no expectations I would get on the show. And I, I and I, when I flew out there, I, I drilled on a few things, uh, some that were smart and some that were dumb. I drilled down that I need to know all my life stories the top of my head. So if there's something that they're going to want to ask me about, like, see if I can tie it to this life story. It says something about me. Right. And know and, and just and, and know what your strengths are and what your weaknesses are. Kind of like the things you would for a normal interview. But the story part was critical. Like I actually sat in my hotel room and typed out all my life stories that I could remember that would be interesting to tell. And so I had them at the top of my head and my fingertips. I can just bring them out at any point. I also said, Christian, don't say um or or stutter over your words at all. And the first thing I sit down in front of Lynn Spillman, the first thing I say is, uh, and I completely, that entire thing just went out the window. But it was okay because I was me. And I was authentically me. It didn't matter that I was saying things perfectly with every enunciation perfectly. But once once I got the energy of how I come across in the room, I killed it. I killed it. I remember I like like that I, I, and, I and the turnaround was crazy from me being I'm going to have this interview. There I'll probably be on a plane home tomorrow. It's probably what's going to happen. But it, it, it came very clear that uh I was I I done very well. I'm like, "Oh my I could actually be on this show. And I don't need to be the best interview here. I just I, I just need to be the best robotics scientist nerd interview here. And maybe I can get on the show. When you went in person, did you spot anybody else that you felt like was fighting for the same spot as you? No. Okay. No. Honestly, Good sign. Uh, yeah. that, that's that, that's what the other thing I realized because I don't know anything about the di about the inside outs of casting. I didn't like peruse the Reddit threads. I was actually reasonably isolated from the common Reddit like online knowledge that sort of people had about Survivor at this point. I, I I was not in that kind of group, so I wasn't like like oh these are the secret super secret rounds of casting that you need to know about. Like I never read anything like that mm -hmm. if those exist. And so like I but when I got there and you like have your very first time where you actually see who's around, I'm like I'm one of the only dudes in glasses here. That's that's normally your hint, right? Like like you're the you're the comical nerd if you're if you're if you're wearing glasses probably. And I'm like whoa okay so it's not like they're putting me in a room with with Cochran and or like Ryan Ulrich or like an Omer or people who are like you know sort of like a white collar professional nerd types who would be good at strategy and maybe funny. You know it was it was like there's Alec. Yeah, mm -hmm. Alex there like I, and uh, uh, and and it, it, it's all the casting types, you know, a a Angie Kant circa 2019 would, would 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 have a field day looking through these character types of casting. And that's what it felt like. It's like, oh, no, this is the, this whole thing could be a cast. It probably won't be. But I'm not going head to head with some with with Cochran, for instance. Yeah. You know. As we're talking this through, and I hadn't really ever thought about this before, but, you know, in the way that they have had to cast the show these last couple of years, where basically they're casting the show completely like on FaceTime, never meeting the participants mm. like in person right. before they're in Fiji, like what a leap of faith uh, they must be taking with each person that gets put onto the show. It's crazy. I would, I, you know, I, I'd be, I'd be interested to talk to some of these, these people from these seasons. Know what yeah. that was like, but it's, it, that's, that is, that's the, the fact that they got a strong cast that they have, given mm -hmm. that that is the process. They, they know what they're doing. Yeah. On that show, and I think that that was, uh, I don't know, that I, 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 I continually tell people that in terms of crazy experiences in my life, uh, like Survivor, of course, it's got to be like at the top in terms of like surreal crazy uh but right behind that is the casting process and how wild that was and the fact that they're able to adapt that in-person process to a zoom process so far it's impressive i mean i uh, i think i think if one of the reasons it probably works as i'm trying to think of where that would go awry. I mean, what, what are the things that, that go wrong in a Zoom interview? Or like maybe like Zoom classes, right? A Zoom class on a test, someone could be cheating with a cheat sheet right there and you couldn't tell, mm -hmm. right? Um, 
very hard to have a cheat sheet for a character interview like yeah. Survivor is. It's very, they, I'd say one thing that they clearly are, must be very good at is ferreting out like inauthenticity or at least weeding out right. the authentic characters. That's hard to fake. Well, I feel like it's less like school and it's more like dating. And eventually, yeah. you know, you're going to meet this person uh, in in person. And, you know, each one of these uh, like real life meetups could be potentially like fraught. Uh, and, you know, who's catfishing basically of like pretending to be this person that they're not actually, you know, or that they're presenting themselves to be one way. But then, you know, you're not going to really know like how they're going to be until they're it's too late, basically. Yeah, that, that's that's yeah. I mean, and so far it seems like they've done, done done a done a great did job. A job. I would, I, yeah, I I would say, um, if I were a person now running a a reality show, especially one that where you're isolating people like you are on Survivor, one aspect that I would want to have in my casting process is isolating the cast before during the interview process yeah. could i take them and put them in a quarantine somewhere or, or in a lockdown somewhere and how do they act as a consequence of that hard to do that when they're at home in their cushy environment right um like i just remember in the casting process i was paranoid just because i was around these other folks you know mm -hmm. like that, that like in a way they got a slice of what i'd actually be like just in terms of my general mood because i'm being observed by someone who looks like John Hennigan across the, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I had to go to the gym at the same time as John With Hennigan. Johnny Nitro? With Johnny Nitro, Johnny Mundo, jo uh, Johnny Impact, the mayor mm -hmm. of Slamtown. Oh, sorry, mm -hmm. everyone knows all these names. I don't need to go through them all. But it's yeah. fun to recite but them during technical it, talks. It, it, yes, and also that I, my son has gotten very into uh, watching wrestling, and uh, yeah. that is a big, uh, a big thrill. That when I'm able to, like, uh, when when John Hennigan or, or John uh, John Morrison uh, is in different, uh, you know, things that we watch. It's like, mm -hmm. Dad, you 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 met that guy? You know you know him? It's like, I'm not sure if you could pick me out of a lineup, but I've met him. <laughs> yeah, it, that, that, him. well, well, for me, I mean, like, I I hadn't had much exposure to the to to the uh, it just uh, the wrestling world. It's never mm -hmm. been something that I had gravitated to, but I, I had a lot more respect about it, respect for it. Uh, certainly after I've talked to John about what it's like to uh, what what the actual artistry is of it and yeah. it's, you know incredibly intensive um I also had overlap in it because I like I I recently had picked up a sort of a magic the gathering habit uh yes. and, and, yes. and, and for, for whatever reason I when I would go to like the, the meetups of the magic the gathering players they're all into professional wrestling and so I'm like, they're talking about like they have it on the TV while the, while, while we're playing our games, and I'm just like, you know, and I, I play it cool, but like I but I did mention it's like yeah, I actually know a professional wrestler, and it's like and I was like, you know, John Morrison is like, oh yeah, Johnny Drip Drip. I'm like, oh, it's like <laughs> it's, uh, apparently that's one of his names now. Okay, so uh, uh, but, but yeah, it's like yeah, I, I happen to know him, you know, from some time ago, and uh, and the, the Magic the Gathering players aren't particularly chatty, so they don't dig mm -hmm. deeper into that connection so sure uh, so it's so i'm kind of uh, so so i i enjoy being sort of undercover how's uh, that going wrestling. by the way oh I, i've had to take a bit of a pause okay. just because of the last few months but like I, I i'm still sorting the cards that i have and like and it's a it's a it's a whole uh, emily calls it my my, my part-time data entry gig mm -hmm. like i'll get a pack of cards and i have software that will that you will enter the cards that you have into a database so that way you know what cards that you have then i will physically sort them into a box in a certain into a certain sorting scheme yeah all before i can actually play the game so uh, so uh, i have a i have a i have a deck or two that i would go and play and i look forward to getting back into it now that the summer okay. here a uh, late night uber ride to uh yeah. go play sometime yeah, that was that was the closest I like felt like to um, trying to like recapture. I don't. I won't say a lost childhood. My childhood was great, but uh, but like something I never got around to doing. And just like, wait, I'm an adult. I have a yeah. credit card. I can Uber to uh, to to a Magic the Gathering uh, game and see what I've been missing yeah. all this time. I will say it, it is a very intensive game, and I think I tried to really catch up quickly. And was overwhelmed by the sheer amount of knowledge required to be to be good at it, and it's a lot of practice. So I'll take some time. You know, I feel like 
Uh, I haven't heard you tell many stories about your childhood. Like, were you were you sort of uh, a you know uh, like a, an adult even as a kid, or were you uh, you know a um, you know uh, a, a, like a, a like a um, rambunctious kid? Uh, I I think that I was probably closer to an adult as a kid, and not by any like pressure or anything. I just I think that um, I tended to gravitate to things that were more i don't say mature but mature seeming mm -hmm. like i remember when i found out about stocks for the first time i think i was like seven and i thought that was so cool and i i said i asked like dad can you buy me a copy of the wall street journal and uh so i had like a wall street journal when i was like said but like, i did that, that was sort of, it was like a fad for me i did it like once and i tried to to graph stocks i think when i was like like 11 on my computer and mm -hmm. just see that oh that's cool like i always i always i always went to those sorts of things but i i was still like a kid you know i still like playing video games with my friends um i wasn't like super outgoing um uh, i wasn't isolated I kind of had my core group of a couple of friends where, you know, the thing we would do is, you know, for each other's birthdays, we'd have a sleepover and play video games into the night. That's what we would, we would do. Mm -hmm. And I would, I, I would go to soccer games. Like I was, uh, I, I would play in soccer leagues and baseball leagues and try out for like, you know, travel soccer teams and stuff like that. I wasn't phenomenal, but I, I wasn't bad. Um, I, I, I would go and during the summer, uh, I would I I I'd kind of split my time between going to you know some sciencey camps. My 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 parents were very supportive of. They knew I liked to do the science stuff. They knew that I liked doing it, so they would try to find opportunities for me to do it. And the other half, I'd go to like swim and tennis clubs. And you know I would so I would I I'd do pool swimming and um so I was a pretty good swimmer. And so wow. I like I, it was like it was it was a nice it was so it well was, balanced. Like, Oh, well, thank you. I, I, I tried to be like, I, like, I, I think that when I was going into survivor, not to take it, make everything about that, but like, I, I thought one of my advantages would be that I was stronger than I looked yeah. and that I, I fit the, the mold of someone who would never play a sport, but I, I did play sports and, um, and enjoyed it. It was better than I, than I looked. I was never, it was never a standout all-star, but I would try really hard. I remember uh, like when I play in soccer teams, like I just like you know, sometimes when I just really want to get things done. I like I like I remember I like in, in my in my area, neck of the woods, we had indoor soccer. I'm not sure if you had indoor soccer, if you ever did that up in uh, Long Island when you grew up or anything. No, uh, no, my parents never had enrolled me in any soccer. OK, soccer. Well, I mean, so, so so in Maryland, it's cold enough enough that that in winter you have to do indoor soccer. And that's mm -hmm. always that, that's indoor soccer is super fun because you get the wall and you can use the wall as a as a passing buddy. So you can oh. pass the ball to yourself, like bank it off the wall, like a little bit of billiards. Right. And you mm -hmm. do kind of crazy things like that. And like I remember, like I would just even though it wasn't the best, I would really try very hard to help the team. Like I would like I, I remember like my coach one year is like Christian would run into walls if it meant getting the ball a little further down the court it's true and i had the body i had the, the the youthful child you know uh uh body to run into walls and not hurt myself uh so i, I would do it and and i i would have like little obsession i would say i'd have little like obsessions over time like like i i would get really obsessed with a like you know either you know doing trying really hard in soccer uh i got really obsessed with pro uh programming calculator games that's something that I did. And I've mentioned that probably about six hours earlier on this podcast. And, uh, and so that was something I got really into. Like I, a, a lot of people in my grade out, we were fortunate enough. Like my parents bought me one of those scientific calculators you play games on. It's what you're talking about. Right. And for those who didn't know, there's a little program function that you can create your own programs. And that's where I learned to do a lot of my coding in this little calculator. So I remember I went on family car trips, I would sit in the back, I'd have my little calculator and I'd code a, code a little game. Apparently I didn't get car sick, uh, which mm -hmm. is good. Um, and I remember the, like I would, like after like a like a spring break or something i would come back to school and i'd have a new game and i would show it to my friends and they would be honest if they liked it or didn't like it and so and so i got i got a lot a of focus group people. right yeah I had basically a focus group and they were not and they would tell me if they didn't like it but they're also things that they did like uh i think my first success was a game called army game no and i'll go back a little further in time my first successful game was the guessing game it was the silliest little game uh where i where literally you would guess the number between one and ten 
And I created little Easter eggs that you could put in cheat codes, but if you put in a cheat code multiple times, it would kill you and stuff like that. So it was a very depthful, not, you know, it, it was a very depthful guessing game. And it made, and, and it would make the rounds because we would have these TI-83 calculators and they have little sharing link cables. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you could share programs with each other. And I knew that if a game was popular, that if I came into a class, like a, like, a, like a math class, and someone had left their calculator, you open it up to see if they have their name in it. I'd open up the programs, and they'd have my game on it. So I know it had proliferated to some other class. So my wow. uh, my, my guessing game, I loved. You're uh, like I, Natalie I, with the Sudoku book. Yeah. <laughs> that's uh, that's that, that's how, yeah, exactly. That's right. It's just sort, you're sort of Italian. checking out. That, yeah. It's sort, of, it's sort of like my market research. Like, is this game catching on? Mm -hmm. And uh, my, my army game was fun. It was kind of like, bas it, was, it was basically all using text characters for, um, uh, for, for, for the game. So the army game was basically Battleship, except you were like an army soldier in the jungle. You can't see anything, but you can shoot in different directions. Kinda, it's almost like Predator. Like, it's almost like the Predator. But yeah. it's a two-player game where you hand the calculator back and forth to people, and you take turns moving and shooting, and you try to pin them down. And and you either shoot, throw a grenade, or you can knife attack, which is a melee one hit kill attack. And that mm -hmm. was a fun game. And they became slowly, slowly more yeah. elaborate over time. I think you need help with your titles. Uh, army game. <laughs> like I feel like you could That's do better. The number. Yeah, but, sure. Yeah, yeah and, and I had I did have eight characters to work with for program okay. titles. So, but like like it was like yeah, it, like uh, like Predator would have been a kind of a better title. Yeah, my branding mm. wasn't great. When yeah. people tried it, they were generally good. And they be eventually the games became so complicated the calculator couldn't handle them. I tried to make a flight simulator for a calculator. Yes. It was hilarious. It's just it, it that thing ran at 1 frame per second, Rob. Mm -hmm. Uh that was so but so that's what I would do. And so that became my obsession, but it actually ended up being accidentally good training for my profession you know like, yeah. uh, like you know, for those who can see the podcast uh, as you can see the, the video podcasting right behind this is not dress window dressing this is on the on the whiteboard behind me this is actually like a like like a program i'm working on right now for robotics and that skill that i learned from coding up math a lot of the time from coding up these games a lot of the time you know i can lay out a, a lay, lay out a computer program like this it's not it's nothing too special it's probably nothing comprehensible but like like this is like I've learned the skill. Like you lay out the the math that you need, you throw it in the calculator, or you throw it in the computer, and you do it. And to bring this all full circle, Rob, and take a breather, um, it was funny because I had like a a real robotics project, a real sponsored robotics project by a company, and we were had I had a deliverable I wanted to deliver, and I was a couple weeks ago, and I was back at home in Baltimore where I grew up, and we were traveling to a family wedding. And the and we were driving up the, up the, up the east coast, and I was in the back seat again, of the car with my laptop, coding again. And I realized mm -hmm. nothing has changed in the last twenty plus years, and so it felt like I'd come full circle. So that's kind of like that's sort of like open ended re response to your childhood question. Rob. Yeah, yeah. Now, I was wondering, uh, did you have any sort of early formative experience with robots uh, that made you say that this is going to be my life's work. I, I think that both my parents and I would agree. It's when I watched this old movie called Short Circuit. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Johnny jo number five. Yeah. Johnny five. I know it Johnny well. five is alive. Yes. And I, my parents tell me, you watch that movie so many times you can recite the plot. And it's like, I, I bet today I barely remember anything about Johnny five other than Johnny five is alive. But I think that, uh, you know, I just I like that that idea. Of yeah. What do you want to know about Johnny Five? I could tell you anything. Oh, so, well, so so like so I, I remember he was struck by lightning and became self aware. He, he and, was made by the military. By the military. Okay, that's right. He had a laser. That's right. I he forgot had a, he had that. Yeah. That was, like, and so was it the first movie or the second movie where he was being chased by other military robots that were like well, I think him. probably the two, first one. Yeah. First movie. Because I forget, the second one he gets lost. In, I think is it lost in New York? Is that Home Alone? <laughs> that's, that's I think I, I, I believe it's the same. I, I believe it is also the, uh, the same plot. It wouldn't surprise me. I mean, that that was kind of the thing. You put them in a new location; they're lost somewhere else. Same idea, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So, I don't like, know short circuits, who had a subtitle, but I do believe he was uh, lost in New York. Yeah. So that was the kind of movie. Oh, that with I Michael was... McKeon, also. Really? Yeah. Well, now I have to rewatch it. Oh, well, there you go. Well, yeah. I love Michael McKeon. Yeah. That's, uh... um, yeah, there, there are certain things about uh, these short circuit films that do not hold up. Uh, but okay. Michael McKeon is. Well, a... 
Yeah, so well, he yeah. is he is in New York, uh, okay. and like he's uh, in the poster for the movie, he's uh, sticking out of a manhole cover. <laughs> That's it's you know I, I wonder how much that is aping off the Ninja Turtles, where they also like had like posters like that where they were. Doing I think this is prior to. I mean, yeah, yeah, Short Circuit was nineteen eighty eight. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, and yeah, so I, I it was like that movie probably got me started, and um and thankfully like like you know. Yeah, my like my parents got me like little Lego kits, or at least a little. I, I had mm. I had a like, and that was something that was very handy. I had something that was called a Dacta Lego kit before there was like Lego Mindstorms, before there was Lego Technic. There was something called Dacta Legos, where you had a single motor, and you had this big brick, which was um, uh, just had a, just like a couple of buttons on it, and so you basically just make you could kind of program it to do some stuff. And maybe it's like one or two motors you had, and so I just make stuff out of that. And, and I didn't need a lot to to I mean that 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 was that was more than enough for me. That was a cool Lego kit, and it got me making some cool stuff. And um and I, I think what I what I found is that like like I I just as a kid like I was really I was grateful for what I had, you know, and I I wouldn't like go and ask for a bigger, better Lego kit. And I would find some way to make this Lego kit work for what I needed it to do. Or like when I had a, my calculator games, like I would find out what I could do with that little calculator, you know, as opposed to like, I'm sure that I could have saved up the money to buy a bigger, better, faster calculator to do the things that I do. I figured out a way to, to, to make it work. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if to, there's, there's a weird way that that applied to my sort of survivor experience where I was just like, this is what I've got. This is what I can do to make this as good as I can. Um, and so uh, that, and, and, and I, that, and that's, that's helpful. And sometimes, uh, but like now as an adult, like I realize, like, wait, I am a, I'm an adult who can spend, you know, money. I can like, like I, I, I can, I can buy the thing that I need that'll make things go crazy. Like that, that's like a, that's like a new thing for me. And so that's kind of a, that's, I don't know, that, that, I say there's one thing that that's been interesting for me as now that I have a, a, a job. So anyway, sorry, it's a bit of a side, it's a bit of an aside, Rob. Sorry. I mean, they're all asides at this point. Yeah, they are. Yeah. But that, so, but so like that was my ascension through robotics was like a lot of people like, like, the, like those movies. I mean, um, I, I'm sure if you talked to a lot of paleontologists, you know, how many of them got into this because of Jurassic Park? You know, mm -hmm. we all, probably probably whole departments of paleontology have been started, are probably populated with people who love Jurassic Park as a kid mm -hmm. or maybe inspired by it. So, I mean, you know, there, I think there's a lot of potential in media. I think we all kind of know this. Yeah, that really is interesting to think yeah. about it that way, because I feel yeah. like that when, you know, the parents are sort of like, um, you know, like uh, the kids, like, okay, let me watch Jurassic Park. I'm like, no, enough of that. You know, that we're not, you know, you're not watching that movie. Um, and to have the, you know, it, it have like a big impact on the scientists of today who might have just, you know, uh, like the parents, like just disregard it. You know, it's, it's impactful. Yeah, I, mean, I think that's something that's it's easy, you know, because we've seen it. We feel like we've seen it all at this point, right? It was, if another movie came out, like like when that movie uh, Real Steel came out with Hugh Jackman, that's the one where he's like yeah. box, doing the boxing robot competition, right? And, and, and me as an adult, it's like, oh, this is kind of like a rock'em sock'em robots kind of like either either like either, uh, like like uh, product placement kind of thing or something. Mm -hmm. But I talk to kids these days, they're like, I loved that movie when I was a kid. Like that's that's what I want to do. I want to make the the shadow boxing uh rock'em sock'em robots robots like oh okay so that that's so that is something that i sort of need to step back and say like this is what you hit some, something hits hits people at a certain age or a certain point in their lives it can be very impactful christian let's go back to a question from uh chloe a who says when you came back home from survivor yeah. how did you or your worldview change yeah. So coming back, I was very scared that I would become a complete narcissist. That's what my concern was, because when you're on the show, you have cameras following you around almost constantly. Right. Yeah. Everything you do is could be important. So there's a camera crew documenting you going to the water well in case something happens at the water well. Right. So I figured like I was like, OK, I got to be careful because I could come back. Uh, and basically like, excuse me, I'm in the kitchen. This is a very important thing. Why is no one paying attention to me going to the kitchen or, or they, you know, when I come back narcissistic like that, I, I didn't, I didn't feel that that happened. 
I was also worried that uh, I would I would be not I'd be less cautious where I would uh, uh, go to the restroom. Mm-hmm. Just because you're so used to just going wherever. Now, uh, is this yeah. when these are things you were thinking on in Fiji about your your concerns about when yeah. you got home? Right, exactly. Okay. Thank you for clarifying. That's what I was concerned that would happen. Yeah, because I I've never talked. You know, I've talked to hundreds of people. Uh, you know, um, hmm. in, in in this thing of ours, and yeah. um, I I've never heard one other person ever voice the concern that they were afraid when they get home, they might be a narcissist. <laughs> really? They're the I, only I, person I've ever heard like, express that thought. <laughs> That's interesting. I like, I mean, it, I think on some level I tried to be aware how weird this is and like, and, um, and even then I think I underestimated how much, like, I, I don't think it made me a, a narcissist, but like it, it is, it's easy to underestimate how different looking you can come back to people, you know, at home. Mm-hmm. And I think the biggest change was, is like, I felt a lot more, shall we say Zen, like all the things that would have bothered me and I would worried about and was fretting about the little things in, in my life. Like they didn't seem to matter as much. It's almost like people who yeah. come back of having, like having had like gone to you know, like, you know, gone through like a near, near death experience. Or right. Like that, right? It, right. It's fleeting, it's but fleeting. you know, when, when, you know, the, the experience of going on survivor and, and, and basic and have, and having nothing and having like all the trappings, uh, you know, uh, stripped yeah. away gives you perspective, but it's mm-hmm. almost impossible. You think when you're there, like, Oh, I'm uh, like, I'll, I'll appreciate everything. Never be uh, the, never, I'll never be the same again. Yeah. 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 Um, but, but, you know, sadly, you know, uh, it, it, it is fleeting. Well, I mean, and, and, I, and thankfully, I actually was felt very prepared for this. I think uh, in because I, I listened to your TOS chapter six. Yes. Uh, I, that was uh, so like uh, your evolution strategy chapter six that you recounted your whole experience. I listened to that so many times because I felt like that was the closest I'd ever get to number one, to like, like experiencing what it's like to hear from someone who was on the show in long form detail. I mean, now, not only do we have you and also the fact that I was on the show, but now we have people on social media telling people, but like, Mm -hmm. but, but one of the things you were talking about is like, you think like, Oh man, I will never not appreciate food again but then that goes away it's fleeting so i like i knew that they would probably these things would be fleeting that there would be an adjustment period and so i kind of came back a little zen and because like i had a lot of i felt like uh career stresses going on that i was worried about and you know there were little interpersonal things you know through people at you know, different institutions and places of work that I was somehow involved with, but all of a sudden they, they did not matter at all at the moment. It's like, you know what? I like after I just went through, this is all fine. I mean, but you know, but it, go, but it does start to slide back. I mean, I'm definitely in a place where I worry about lots of things that go on at work and that I'm back in that place. But it was nice to have at least had the experience and remember there was a time where it didn't matter so much like like that you, you don't have to exist in that mode like mm-hmm. and so if people talk up to me about like hey christian would you ever play again if so why would you play again one of the reasons to do it would be to have sort of a reminder another reminder of what it's like to go through that but i i, I to have that feeling of there's other things out there other than what's on the path in front of you that mm-hmm. that detour can give you some perspective um Experiences can be different, though. Yeah. So who knows? But um, I, I will yeah. say that, and, and again, my my second experience was nowhere near uh, like the the first experience. But but I think that the first experience I I, I feel like is so, tr- you know, transformative. And yeah. and then armed with knowing that, oh, but but I felt this before, and it didn't hold. Yeah. I don't know if you really do get that on return yeah. appearances to yeah. survive. And, and I, and I do think that that is one of the things that makes people often not enjoy uh, ret- return trips because I feel like that the first time you go and do it, that, that there is sort of like, you know, that you feel like that there was meaning in your suffering. Uh, yeah. to like uh, bring like the you know Victor Frankel into it. Um, and the second time, like I think you end up feeling, and again, 
I, I didn't, maybe there are other people that, you know, that, uh, had, you know, longer second experiences that feel differently, but because you already know that, okay, I did this once. And then I, I, I remember feeling this way, but I also remember that then it did, it didn't last. Mm -hmm. Um, you are sort of like more aware of sort of like, uh, you know, the, you know, what, what this all is and are a little more aware to sort of like that. Okay. This is, this is a TV show as opposed to um, that this is going to be a profound experience in my life. Yeah, and I think that what that would mean, I think an implication of that, Rob, would be if, if I wanted to recapture that feeling, the solution might not be go on a TV show again. It's to do some other adventure that similarly gives you some sense of perspective. Mm -hmm. um, like one thing I always wanted to do is just like go to like northern Alaska for like a little bit of time like yeah. like just like so we're just you're just isolated away from everything and you have to live maybe live in a cabin with a simpler existence even for a bit where maybe you don't have email you know and uh and just and 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 just pontificate life and live a simpler existence for that time and and come back with perspective from that so that maybe that's the lesson and i totally agree with you that that like you know me going out there i mean it helps that you know like I, I felt I got almost everything, everything I could have gotten from that experience. Right. I mean, so I, you know, a million dollars has been great, but like it, there, there are like, it, like I got to do the fun things I wanted to do on the show. I got to talk about science in a way that, you know, like, on, 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 like for people to understand, I got to uh, meet a lot of cool people. I mean, I thought, our, I think our cast gets along great. And, um, I, I got, and I got, to, and I get along with them. I got to meet some lifelong friends through that. And think of all know, the podcasts the, we've made the podcast. Like this, this is the thing. And I told you this before this podcast, like, like we got to meet each other through this mm -hmm. and, um, and I get to talk about things I've always found interesting, um, including survivor, right? I like you're, you're probably getting like, on this podcast and others we've done together, Rob, the things that have been sort of rattling around in my brain for years mm -hmm. that are kind of like percolating up. And now I have, I, and, and now I can sort of either have a validated or invalidated from my actual experience on the show. So I get all this out of that experience and there are other adventures to have too. One of the questions that I had been thinking for you today, uh, as you know, we've seen sort of like in recent weeks, uh, you know, announcements about uh, other shows, uh, you know, the CBS mm. challenge. Yeah. Um, there are a couple of shows that are going to be on NBC that feature former reality uh, or people from uh, Survivor. And I, I just had been wondering. Would you ever consider another reality opportunity that was not Survivor? Would that be interesting to you? I know you've talked about yeah. uh, the American genius uh, is something that you would be interested in participating, but but short of that, yeah. Oh, and so so and so people were wondering about the American genius thing. I I I was saying I would love to be involved in the production of that. Oh, not and, on. Like, no, okay. Well, I, I'd be fun. No, be on the fun. Be fun, but I don't want to be accused of calling myself a genius. That would be yes. You know, that, that, but, that would but, be your yeah. your worst fear. You have you know, a <laughs> narcissist. Yeah, right. Exactly. But uh, so yeah, no. But but either of those things would be fun. Yeah. I mean, I, again, this comes down like what I think it's important that for you know anyone applying for a show or that you're interested in. I mean, again, first time can be magical absolutely magical so i think that it can just be a fun experience irrespective of really what you want to get out of it but like any of these things like i ask myself what do, what do i want to get out of it right and uh i i definitely want like my, my checklist of what i would want to do if i were to go on some other tv show would be like like what what do i want to accomplish like i i definitely i love communicating science that's probably my most proud thing i'm most proud of from doing on my season of survivor i got i got there's an episode of a television show on imdb called breadth first search and mm -hmm. i can tell people that at academic conferences and like even the most cynical of them their eyes grow wide mm -hmm. like, what? Mm -hmm. yeah exactly it's like yes that's right and so um it, so it, the, the, so i i love to something where I could do that and, you know, in, in a way that it hopefully would present me presented in a, in a non-negative way and hopefully in a positive way. Right. Um, to where the actual structure of the game is interesting. Like I could act where I, where I could have fun either in confessionals or in some other capacity. It's like, 
this is why this is cool. Like, you know, what, what, like one of these shows is like what I think called Snakes in the Grass. I think it's yes, one that came out yes. today. It's like, just, that, just now, announced today. Just announced Hot today. Out of the presses. Yeah. So it sounds like, it's like, the, like the mole. And I think like, like Yule was in there, like in it and Malcolm and Sri and. Um, uh, I'm, uh, I'm not sure. The, I'm not sure if Yule was a, that uh, okay. I had heard Earl, uh, Earl, but I'm not sure that uh, if. Yeah. Uh, if you will also, I think there was an, a number of people, Sari, uh, right. yeah, Stephanie, yeah. Stephanie LaGrosa. So, yeah. um, I, I'm not, uh, Trish, Trish Hegarty. Yeah. I think I heard Trish was in it. Yeah. So that, and, and the people from other reality shows, right. It's sort of a, mm -hmm. a, a, a all star cast of the, uh, of those. Yeah. It's uh, like, if I were like, I got to be on that show and I'm like with Earl, I like, I, I, as long as I get the opportunity, it's like, what, this is super cool because I don't know who the snake in the grass is, but if it's Earl, it would be this. And that's why this interesting, right? Something where the actual format of the show is about an idea, or at least there's an idea that you can convey. And that, I mean, so like, um, like I imagine, even though I've never seen the show, I imagine the bachelor or the bachelorette is not quite, doesn't quite function like that. That's not what people, or that's not what the, the producers are going for. Not that there may not be interesting people on the show. I don't, I don't see it, but like, I, I'm not sure if people would be like, this is what's so fascinating about The Bachelorette. See, I'm one of seven to ten bachelors, and there's sort of a game theory thing going on. I'm not sure if that they, I, maybe, that, you know, that, that, that I'm not sure if, the, if their contestants have done I think that what we need thing. maybe is the TI-83 version of The Bachelor to really explore <laughs> some of the game theory mechanisms. Yeah. Exactly. It's, yeah, so it, it's, um so it, like, it's something where the, where there's something at the core of the show that's interesting. And, I, and the other thing I, I'll say about Survivor, I, I don't know about these other shows. I mean, I, I hope that they're successful, and I hope that the people on them have a great time. Um, the one thing I was very clear when I went to Survivor Cast, I hope the podcast which, recaps are incredible. Yeah, that of course that that's that goes without saying, Rob. Yes, goes, yes. It, it, the Survivor production crew, when I met them, I got the sense that they were willing, that they, they were ambitious and they were worked very hard and they cared a lot about what they were putting together. Mm -hmm. That it wasn't just a cynical enterprise of, okay, it's next season, throw, throw together another season. Okay, what contestants do we churn through the meat grinder to get our ratings out of? Now, I didn't get that impression when I met them. Like, And even when I met Jeff, like the first thing I talked about, I talked about system identification and robotics. And he looked me dead in the eyes. He was like, yeah, please tell me more. Like he's a guy who at least cares about like he, he seems to care about these kinds of ideas and i've talked about this but in the past as well so like there's an there's there's at least an intellectual ambition it's certainly not the only thing that the show cares about but there's a role for it and if it's if they can find a way to fit it into a good story they can do they, they at least they they can do that they don't necessarily always do that with every character i was very 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 lucky that i got a lot of things i wanted to say on the air but like that's but that's something I, I I sense from the production, and if the team like of a show like that is talking about that kind of thing, that, that is up my alley. That would be interesting. Okay, how about this uh, from Grape Juice has a question. Hi, Robin Christian, huge fans of you both. Uh, does Christian remember every topic he discussed with Jeff during the Marathon <laughs> Immunity Challenge against? Alec, uh, we would love to hear what was talked about beyond plant root growth and Reuben sandwiches. So um, it's hard for me to say I remember everything. In fact, what I really should do, I should go and list all the things and just go down the list and just like, just keep updating it so that way I have that. That's um, it's one of the things I wish I had done right after the show, well, right right during, in Ponderosa even. But honestly, even though I was at Ponderosa for like four days, it felt like no time at all. So it went by so fast, I barely had time to <laughs> felt like I had time to write anything. Plus, mm -hmm. you're also still emotionally processing the entire experience. I, I believe I forget uh, which player did. I think maybe Ricard said on Twitter that he wrote down everything he could right after he was done to preserve it as before, before it got aired. And I think it's something like that. Yeah, exactly what you should do. I totally recommend that for anyone going through any experience, especially a reality show experience like Survivor. And so I'll give a few things that I. Uh, I, I maybe briefly mentioned uh, or, uh, before. I've got to go through things that probably have not gotten as much note, note okay. in our podcast. I, at one point, Allison was still in the challenge, and I I wanted to choose. I was like, Allison, you want to talk for a bit? Because I was afraid of looking annoying on television, and so I wanted to 
at least ask if people wanted to mm -hmm. talk. Eventually, I gave up on that because I was in such pain. So uh, I and I was like, I was, and I said, oh, uh, Alice is like, it's like Allison. It's like you want to talk? She's like, sure. About what? And I was like, so what was your curriculum for your med school program? And she's like, I'll want to, I'll talk about anything else. And so it's just like it's like you can tell that she was not in the mood to talk about the curriculum for a med school program. And, and mm -hmm. as an academic, I'm always a person. I'm the kind of person who will uh, who is like, oh, you're electrical engineering. You're a third year. Did you just take your linear systems class? How is that? You know, that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah. So I, so I talked to her about that. I said, well, what about. You know, Allison, I'm thinking about having like a second wind right now. And I remember that I felt I remember in school at some time that someone explained that the idea of a second wind came from a physiological concept of how where you're, how energy is getting burned in your body. Like you, you, you use up your glucose first and then you run out of energy, but then you start burning fat and you get a second wind of energy. And she's like, oh, actually, Christian, I think it's more of a, of a, of a psychological concept. And I, I was referring to her opinion as a doctor. It's like, oh, interesting. I thought it was physiological. And she's like, yeah, I, I, and so, so, so she explained to me it's a, probably a psychological concept. I should, Did that ever get settled? That's an interesting bar bet. You know what? That's a good one. I I I need to do that. I need I need to I need to follow up with Allison. I should have followed up with her at her wedding a couple of months back. But uh, you know at the, at about that. But she's probably busy. She's probably busy <laughs> at that point. But uh, um, so I so I, I so I, I I remember I played twenty questions and we played two rounds of it. And, uh, and, and, you know, and Gabby was the chose the twenty questions one time and she chose a hot dog. And I guessed it, and I think ten guesses or nine. And I, but because I, because I had a very very good question, uh, which is, is it bought or sold in a Walmart? I I, re I recommend that question. And her answer was sometimes like, okay, it must be a food item because sometimes Walmart does or does not sell food items. And 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 I, and I, and I think it's, it's made out of beef. And she's like sometimes, and I'm like, hot dog. So anyway, that's I, I got wow. lucky there. Very and. Good. Uh, the, now, had I, I, you had that Walmart question uh, just in the holster, ready to go from prior to Survivor, or you thought of it on the spot? I thought of it on Survivor because in the first few days of the David Beach, when we're stuck in the rain shelter at night, we were playing 20 questions, and I started to devise a good 20 question strategy during that point. And I was like, oh, the Walmart one's probably a good one. So on the island, but before that mm -hmm. challenge. And then I played 20 questions where I was choosing the, choosing the item. So I chose my own robot shirt. Uh, to see if they would get to that. I was curious if they would get to that, and they did. Uh -huh. um, so um, I definitely gave uh, my critiques about Survivor Game Changers uh, to Jeff. I think Jeff wanted to die. Yeah, what uh, specifically was the critique about the advantage get-in? It wasn't even the advantage get-in. It was, I the said, casting? Like, I, it was I definitely didn't say that to them. Yeah, the casting is awful. That's why did you even put me on this show? Mm -hmm. uh, but the but I, I I said the the uh, thing that annoyed me was the transferability of the non transferability of the the steal a vote uh, that Sari got, and I like that's the thing that really snookered Sari because she thought she had possession of the steal a vote, which would mm -hmm. which was like going to be her master stroke. That she were taking control yes. of the game. Go on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So very interesting. So then were, were they sort of like hat in hand, like, uh, yeah, no, 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 we we got that. We know that, that was a scrub. Or, or were they actually pushing back against what you were saying? Jeff, I think I I, I don't think Jeff was enjoying this part of my review because like I think he was kind of like he, he was like, Yeah, 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 whatever. Like we're and never I, gonna I, use I, this on the show. We're it, never it, gonna it, be talking about yeah, it. That's three seasons ago in this yes. community challenge. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I realized now, like I, 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 there were times where Jeff would get a little, you know, like, snippy at me. And I assumed it was cause I was annoying him and, that, and it very well could be the case, but I think that's producer Jeff. Like I, I, I realized after the fact there's producer Jeff who is saying, will this thing make air or not? And if it's not mm -hmm. going to make air, maybe we should talk about something else. And I mean, you experienced that directly with, uh, with, um, Casey Kasem gate. <laughs> and um and and, uh, and slightly different slightly different but, but yeah it's, it's a, and um but like uh, like there were times where like i you know jeff often was very game he's he's the same kind of person you see on the show he's very positive but then there's sometimes he jumps in is like you know that will never make air and like and i was like oh, that, i wasn't saying it to make air i was just saying it to, to say it so mm -hmm. like I, I think there are times where i'm not viewing it as the tv show that it is i'm viewing yeah. it as an experience and so yeah go on and i can relate to that because i feel like you know sort of like uh not so much in the survivor podcast per se but there's other podcasts uh that 
you know, I am on. And sometimes I'm like, all right, like uh, people are talking about something like, all right, is this interesting? Come on, let's get, let's get back. Let's get back on track. I'll be like, oh, Rob is so mean. Uh, it's like, well, I'm still, tr- we're trying to make a, you know. Yeah. We're, well, you, and you, yeah, you make we sense. We lost it makes sense the plot. You. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and, and for you, I mean, and, uh, and to me, like, I, I of course get that. And for you though, mm-hmm. as a podcaster, the assumption is you're going to leave in 90 plus percent of what you talk about on the podcast. You're not going to edit out whole segments that are, that are, that are tangents. Whereas we're out there for 39 days anyway, and they're right. going to cut you know, uh, you know, some ungodly percentage of that material anyway. Not everything needs to be crafted for the television moment right now, Jeff. You know, mm-hmm. it's a uh, um, right. But I, I could I, see where in that yeah. challenge, you don't know who's gonna fall. Like, uh, you know, yes. um, if true. Gabby is gonna fall off, um, then all right, we're sort of like the footage is, uh, you know, we're gonna yes. really have to get creative with uh, yeah. cutting around this. Exactly. So that 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 might be it. I, I will say, it, like, it was very insightful as a as a not even van- amateur video editor. That's what I am. Mm-hmm. I, I edit videos for robots and sometimes I'm putting comp- or compelling robot videos of what we do. Like l- having experienced that whole challenge and seeing how it comes out on the other side and you're like, oh, I see how they clearly have control over the audio that they can include from each individual person. Because I remember what I would be saying at a particular time when someone would be saying something else and I'm like, oh, they're able to pull out that audio uh, from what that person was saying without me and then play with it. Um so yeah, so I, I talked about Survivor Game Changers. I probably was really starting to, to, to bother Jeff, you know, the poor, poor guy. Like someone asked Jeff, saying, hey Jeff, what was it like to you know to get did you think that Survivor was gonna be on the air so many years when you started, you know, the show? And I'm thinking that's like, well, that's a silly question. Of course, no one thinks the show is going to go on for 20 years when they when they do it in, in the yeah, business for the right. show. Uh, I, so I jumped in. It's like, of course, Jeff didn't know it was going to be on for 20 years. In fact, I remember this interview <laughs> from Jeff from a long time ago where he clearly said that he didn't. He didn't think Did he homework. appreciate you answer the question for him? Because I feel like that he 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 obviously would not have wanted to answer that question. Is like uh, I'm sure he would have just given like ah uh, yeah uh, like a one word answer. Did did he did he seem to appreciate that? I, I I don't know if he appreciated that one. I I can see why you think that. I think that I, I was probably just interrupting him at that point. Yeah, that's probably just annoying generally. And and so uh, I remember at one like early on he was more playful. Like I remember. I was trying to find new techniques to try to to try to distract myself from the pain before I figured the, out the, the strategy of talking. So I tried counting all the little grass patches on the ground in front of me, and I said, I, then I tried to find a place to focus. So I was like, Jeff, I am focusing on your dimple right now. And it's like, so he's like, okay, so if I do this with my tongue, am I going to screw you up? Mm-hmm. Oh my God, that's, that's a funny joke, Jeff. Mm-hmm. I wish I had a quit or come back to that. I didn't. Um, mm-hmm. And at one point, like we talked about prime numbers, Jeff and I were talking about prime numbers. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I think Jeff clearly, he very much knows what a prime number is. And he was explaining that he and his friend have a game where they just try to list prime numbers off as they each, they each take turns saying, you say a prime, you say a prime. And eventually it gets old, harder and harder and harder as the primes become more scarce, as the numbers become bigger. And I said, and I started talking a little bit about prime numbers. And he said, Christian, why don't you explain what a prime number is? And I'm realizing now this is TV bait because he knows what a prime number is, but they might want to use it for the television show. Mm-hmm. So I started, like, well, a prime number is a number that is that that is divisible by that is only divisible divisible by one and itself. So you have to remember that one is actually not a prime number because one is itself and is technically not a prime. That, that's the kind of thing I'm giving mm-hmm. to the camera at that mm-hmm. point. But I think at that point he's he's fishing for material, and that was very early. And I think later on, I think it's he 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 seemed in pain. Um, I I I I. I I I, rem- I I I'll never forget. Like I, I it, you know, I and I, I mean this lovingly because you know, I he didn't ask for this, but at the same time, you know, I'm in. The, I'm fighting for my 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 immunity, and uh, and so so he had to deal with it. Uh, but I, I also I also think of it like you know, Jeff is a pretty powerful celebrity. How many people can hold him in a room for hours on end mm-hmm. and he can't leave? Yeah. Probably not many people on this planet can do that to Jeff Probst, and yet I was detaining him for this time mm-hmm. um so i mean that yeah so and, and so and it yeah. do you feel like in that afternoon did you forever change survivor challenges because i'm trying to remember even in the last couple seasons um that uh, certainly like at this point like the yeah. the endurance challenges are like you know if they're 20 minutes it's like a marathon yeah. um mm-hmm. and, and i and i don't really recall 
I, like 38 was probably not enough time to change what was going on. But in 39 and 40, did they have these uh, very lengthy endurance challenges? Uh, they haven't. I mean, I, I, I try to say with all humility, I think you're actually very right. I think that that challenge, me and Alec going that long, um, I think there must have been a directive. I, I don't have no inside information, but there must mm -hmm. have been a directive to make sure that the rules of these challenges are such that they do not go on that long. I mean, it was it was a real inconvenience for the production. I think they got great TV out of it. I got a lot out of it. Uh, you know, I, I you know, uh, I got, we're I, still I got talking about it. Still yeah. talking about it today. And, um, it's, uh, um, and it, so, but like for the production crew, I mean, if we tribal council had to be delayed by a full day, we were supposed to go to tribal council that night. And, uh, and we broke and the game. Was, we broke, we broke it. That, that changed the shooting schedule yeah. of the show. And, and you could not do that in a 26 day season. No, there's no way. Like uh, that, that's that, like, like, so I think that there's no way they're going to let that happen. And, um, and the editing schedule, as much as I, they did a wonderful job in the editing department, man, the, the, I, I got to meet briefly the hero editor who, uh, um, who, who edited me when I went to Los, to Los Angeles and, you know, apparently they'd spent at least an extra week or so on filming. I've heard various estimates on editing the show because of that challenge. I mean, he said there were 19 different camera angles for five and a half hours. I have to go through that footage and find the gold. I have to find it. And, and he had constructed multiple versions of the story. Um, there was one where he even included uh, what he, he was telling me they almost included a shot where uh, where I was talking about how this scene sequence will probably be edited on television. Mm -hmm. And so like, it's just a meta joke. And, and they say that didn't quite get through. I was like, Oh dang, that would have been fun. Uh, yeah. Cause like, cause I just assumed, I mean, I know enough, barely enough about editing to be like, this is going to be a crossfaded montage. That's what's going to happen right now. If they're going to show this at all, it's going to be a crossfaded montage of me talking, 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 talking. And that, that's mm -hmm. just what, that's from, a, from a language of, 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 of film, that's how you show the passage of time. And I, I, uh, I, I was impressed how they handled it with all that. But anyway. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. A couple more questions for Dr. Hubicki. Irene yeah. wants to know which Super Smash character is your main? Ah. So uh, this, this this question brought me back. I'm mostly uh, late high school, college. I was into Super Smash Brothers and other fighting games as well. 2D fighting games, two and 3D fighting games. Uh, I was I played as Young Link. Uh, which I believe, Young in Link. Of, yes, it was uh, in the scheme of it, it's it's move set was slightly, slightly quicker, which I liked. Um, as I as I started to glimpse the the realm of truly competitive professional level Smash Brothers mm -hmm. play, uh, Young Link is not considered a high tier character. Oh. Uh, it's a low tier character, so if you so I could enter into low tier character tournaments as Young Link, and because so, because the move sets were not as overpowered. Yeah. Um, but I was really into uh, fighting games in college because I had a lot of friends uh, who were my co-founders of the Bucknell Video Game Club. Um, wow. So we, we founded the Bucknell Video Game Club. I was the treasurer. Of the, yes. of the okay. We had no budget, but I was the treasurer of the video game club. Mm -hmm. And we well, we all spontaneously formed a, a club because we – would go into the engineering building at night, which is open 24 hours a day and had these projectors. And we were like, Oh, we'll hook up our GameCube to this yeah, projector yeah. and we'll play into the night. And that's what we did. And so we ended up making a club out of it. Um, I think the, the club's name was called Crade, uh, which we backronymed into uh, killing racing and intellectual discussion for video games. <laughs> so uh, that's a, uh, that, that's a, uh, was what is, what it stood for. Um, and so yeah, so we got a lot of the fighting games, and particularly I was into the Soul Calibur series. And me and a few of my friends would uh, would travel up and down the East Coast, going to inform, going to tournaments uh, wow. in college. Yeah, you, you played okay. competitively. Yeah, I was okay. I would say, uh, like, like uh, I, I eventually got to the point where, like, uh, like the top tier people would have to try to beat me. I was mm. never like top on the East Coast or anything. I did reasonably well in one of the East Coast tournaments, but like my, but my, but my roommates were like were diehards and they and they they actually managed to make it pretty high up the circuit uh but i would say it was a very interesting learning experience because uh you go from playing with your friends and you think you're good amongst your friends 
But then you go and play amongst like people at like a nearby college and you realize you're terrible. But then you learn a valuable lesson about like what the, how the game is really played at a high level. And the the lessons, the key lesson I learned was that was that it's a game of adaptation. When you're playing a fighting game, it's not about just oh I'm the best at executing this move sequence on the controller. That's a skill. That's an important skill. But what you're really doing are playing rock paper scissors. Uh, with with an opponent, I mean, and uh, I know I know that Ken Huang would be able to tell you. Kenny Huang would probably be able to tell you this on a on a Smash Brothers scale. He's like he's a professional, uh, and he would. But he's he even talked about though in uh, in Survivor Gumbo, Gabon. I want to say he talked about the idea that you're playing when you're playing these games, you're playing mind games with people, and that is exactly right. You want tr you're tricking someone to throw a rock when you're about to throw out a paper. And by because you throw out scissors two times before that, and there's so they trick them to throw out a rock and cover it with a paper. Now, they're of course not literal rock, paper, scissors, but it's like, oh, my character is going to throw out a high attack, you can duck it with a low attack, but that can be, but but that low, but 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 that by being ducked gets hit by a mid attack, and basically it's sort of a rock, paper, scissors mechanic, and you have to learn to play mind games with your opponent. And so the best players are people who are like really good at mind games and are basically playing rock, paper, scissors. Mm -hmm. So that's what I learned from like the just glimpsing what the super competitive level of fighting yeah. games is that I didn't know that that's what it's about. And I learned a lot. Do you still play? Not anymore. Uh, it's been many years since I played those games. Um, but I tell you, Super Smash Brothers Melee, which Link's was old now. Link's old. He's old now. But the mm -hmm. game is old, but still being played. I'll tell you, I stopped by the, the store that has the Magic the Gathering tournaments. And on I had no idea on Saturdays they or Sundays they had people playing Super Smash Brothers. I mean, that game mm -hmm. is like 20 plus years old now. And and uh and or 20-ish years old, and people are still playing it. There are some games that get the mechanics just right. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's sometimes it's video games like Super Smash Brothers. StarCraft One was a hugely popular in Korea. For Army many game, years. Army game, still going strong. The meta, the Army game mm. meta, I think, is still highly evolving. And the original Survivor format, I think, there's a lot. I mean, when you get the right format, there, there there's the people. It, it, it sticks around, and uh, so and sometimes it's hard to get the balance just right. But when you do, it's magic. Okay. Amanda Danforth, uh, associate producer Amanda from Renap says, uh, did you see Don't Look Up? What did you think of it? The Oscar nominated Don't Look Up. Oh, was it nominated for Oscar? Okay, interesting. Like I so yeah, I I, I did see Don't Look Up. I watched it over the holiday break. I have very mixed feelings about it. There's some things now, I yeah, go on. Yeah, well, it was the thing that you liked that people said that Leonardo DiCaprio uh resembled you in the film? People said that? Well, oh, I like that. That. Yeah. that. That goes up a few points for me. Well, one thing I'll say about Leonardo DiCaprio, um, I think it came out. At, so in one of the early scenes in the movie, he's on a whiteboard, okay, doing yeah. the calculations for um, uh, for 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 whether or not it's going to hit Earth, and he realizes, oh my God, this thing might hit Earth, and it was. It came out that Leonardo DiCaprio had a math stunt double to oh. do that scene. He had a scientist. It could have in. been you. It could have been me. And so I so, so, so yeah, he had they actually contacted a real astrophysicist who kind of had the same build as Leonardo DiCaprio, put him in the same flannel shirt, mm -hmm. and did a shot of him writing the equations on a whiteboard. I think like, well, that's first off, how do I get a gig in math stunting? That mm -hmm. sounds awesome. I mean, I do yeah. plenty of that. And um, and 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 two, like the, the, the this is Leonardo DiCaprio. He was in the revenant. And he famously refused to have a stunt double in the Revenant when he was eating raw liver, of like right. uh, like for a scene. He's he 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 will eat raw liver before he learns to write a single math equation on a whiteboard. Mm -hmm. and I was like, that's interesting. <laughs> I put this out on Twitter. I was like, Did you, how crazy is that? Like that like the, the, like you know this guy will do crazy things in the yeah. middle of the wilderness and he won't write a math equation. And I actually got a response from all people. The the multi universe guy, the, the uh, Sean Carroll who wrote that book, replied to me and said because he lives in in Pasadena, he lives in near Hollywood and probably consults in lots of space movies, and said Hollywood actors have a really hard time like if you, you writing on whiteboards, writing equations on whiteboards. If you haven't been doing it for years like us professors have, 
it's very unnatural. And it's so weird because it's like, it's second nature to me, but I didn't think of that as, as, as a learned skill that they would have to bring in a stunt double for it. But that's a bit of an aside about Leonardo DiCaprio in that mm-hmm. movie. Uh, so I learned about math stunting from that movie. That's a big plus. And I liked a lot of the themes of the movie. Um, I, I liked what they were going for. Um, and maybe it's an Adam McKay. I think there's some things about how Adam McKay makes a movie that some things stick with me well. And some people, some things I, 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 I as a science communicator, I disagree with how you come how it comes across. Like so a lot of times, I think when Adam McKay presents certain characters who are wrong, he will present them as dumb. Or and like like it, and or, or just completely irredeemably bad or just, or weird or or lost like like the Meryl Streep character character is horrible, you know in, in right. this in this movie. And so no no two no two that's about it. And she's the person who's distorting the science of this co- of this of this uh, comet coming to strike the Earth. Yeah. Is um, there another the, Adam McKay uh, film that you're also referencing? Yes, I am. The Big Short. The big Got short. It. Okay, and this is I mean, and I maybe I'll just ping you as a poll. Uh, so, uh, I, so uh, on, on this. So the thing I saw so the big short originally. I remember there was one thing about that movie that I remember. There was Margot Robbie in a bathtub. I remember that Margot Robbie was in a bathtub. This is some sound familiar to you, Rob? You right, so I scene? have not seen the film, right? Steve okay. Carell, though, right? Steve Carell's in it. So, like, I remember, like, all I remember was that Margot Robbie's in a bathtub, and the gag is that. The film is trying to to break is breaking the fourth wall to explain some complicated reason that the banking system failed. Okay, and yeah. the gag is that like this is so boring. So we're gonna have Margot Robbie in a bathtub explain it to you, basically implying that's the only way you'll pay attention right. to this. And she delivers a monologue, and I don't remember a single thing other than the fact that it was Margot Robbie in a bathtub. And you don't have to be leering at her to do it. It's just so distracting. Like, I don't remember anything that she said. And so I had to go uh, – recently I, I went and watched the movie again and see if I remembered anything mm-hmm. and about she said. And I went and listened to the, the dialogues. Okay, mm-hmm. what she's saying makes sense. I don't remember a lick of it. And, and so it's it's the kind of science communication that's um, – you know, like what's like it's you know, we'll talk about science, but dress it up with an explosion or dress it up with something that you, we right. that we think you right. stereotypically want to watch, right? As opposed to finding a clever way to deliver that same material. Um, I like I think that like uh, like you know, what you were saying about Better Call Saul. Yeah, Better Call Saul. Or here's a science communication concept. I mean, uh, the movie A Beautiful Mind. That's mm-hmm. uh, the pop the, the, about John Nash, who won the game theory, you know, talking mm-hmm. about game theory and, you know, Nash and, and uh, could have used Cole some uh, whiteboard stunting there. Yeah. So um, exactly. And, and so that and he maybe he did his own stunts. I'm not sure. I think Matt Damon did his own stunts in Goodwill Hunting. Mm-hmm. Uh, so and and the I love for it, referring to Matt as stunts. I think we're going to do that from now on. And in Be- A Beautiful Mind, they have a scene where they explain the core concept of game theory and the prisoner's dilemma, which is that right. you have John Nash with these women at a bar and all of his buddies are going to hit at these women on a bar. And the, and the analogy was pretty simple, that if we all try to hit on the same woman, all the other ones are going to be, get mad and none of us get anything. You know, that was the analogy. You know, weirdness aside of the choice of analogy, I remembered it mm-hmm. because they turned the situation into the concept as opposed to say, here's something for your attention and I will blab at you. And I think it's and so so it, it, so so it's 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 something where like I feel like Adam McKay's heart's in the right place. He wants to get certain concepts across, but he uh, but he f- often falls short when and how he goes about it. I, the the best analogy I will say in the, in the Big Short there there, uh, there is one where they're trying to explain uh, sort of derivative trading or or like, I forget the name of it, but basically the idea that not only were bankers betting on how the market would go, people were betting on how well other bankers would do who were betting on how the market how, how the on how the market would go. And so it's a sort of chain betting and they explained it by having Selena Gomez at a blackjack table and people were betting on how well she would do as uh, at the blackjack table. It's a whole chain of people betting on it. So when she lost, everybody lost lost and so it so and and it didn't need to be selena gomez it could have just been anybody but at least the scene communicated the concept well mm-hmm. okay so uh, yeah so i mean that, that that's like one of my peeves about how anna mckay chooses to do these things but otherwise there are certain things that he gets like the the mood right of i feel like a lot of scientists when they feel when a scientist is proclaiming the sky is falling and how they're often treated in the media and by politicians like, oh, you can't say 
hundred percent chance that it's going to happen. You got to say, you can't even say 99, 9.9%. Let's say 70, let's say 70% chance it's going to happen. Like the, how mm -hmm. sometimes the message is that sometimes real scientific findings get watered down by politics or people won't get put on TV because they're too boring about the subject. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not a, it's not a sexy headline, you know, it's kind of, and, and they're putting, and I get that it's satire. And it, it sometimes does a satire pretty well in don't look up, but like, yeah, it, but sometimes it, it feels like the the people who don't believe it, you know, are lost causes, and we shouldn't try to convince them, or like they're beyond hope. When that's like the opposite. As a science communicator, I think everyone can get these things. Mm -hmm. So, Christian, were there any other questions uh, that you wanted to make sure we hit tonight? Well, we hit a lot of them. I don't think we have to go terribly much longer. Let's see. The I think that. Uh, uh, yeah, I think I pretty much covered okay. um, uh, all all the questions that you know that are that were super necessary. That will go into another hour long tangent. Okay, so. um, Puya wanted me to ask you: Have you been yeah. following Ninety Day Fiance this season? I have not. Not I, I followed Ninety Days before the Ninety Days last last season. Yeah, I know Emily is following it, and also your coverage. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so I, so sometimes I walk into the kitchen I'm like, oh, there's Robin Puya talking. So I kind of wait for, so I kind of wait for her to tell me how the season's going. And, uh, the reason is very specific because I have very, it's a lot of, um, oh yeah. So, and, uh, and I think that there's a lot of times on the show where stuff is happening that I cannot watch <laughs> and, I have, I have well, a lot of reasons you cannot watch. What do you, we, it's disturbing to you. It's things are disturbing to me. Like it, it's a very specific thing. I have a hard time watching shows where awkward relationship moments happen. Oh, and that's a, that, that, yeah. Yeah. I have well, the opposite I, problem. So, so, so you love watching the show. I love it. Yeah, and, 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 and so like, I just, I, I think I just, I, I empathize a little too much with the situation. And I just like, it's, it's like, like sometimes if you have secondhand embarrassment so much that you have to leave the room, that's like what I have all the time. Mm -hmm. Like I remember like there are, there are movies I will be sitting watching and enjoying. It has nothing to do with relationship drama, but then one character is caught cheating on another character. I'm out. I'm done. Wow. I leave the room. Yeah. No, I, I, I watched the devil wears Prada. And I was watching this movie. I'm enjoying it. And Anne Hathaway kisses the guy from Men Mentalist, who's not her boyfriend. And yeah. I'm, I'm worried that Andrea Grenier is going to see. I just. Boy, I, I, I hope Meryl Streep isn't listening to this podcast. Meryl Streep is great. To be clear, Meryl, Meryl, you're great. The actors are great. I got to say, Jonah Hill, especially. He, I think he nails the comedy of that mm -hmm. movie, Don't Look mm -hmm. Up, very well. He's someone who, for some reason, the way his lines are delivered, and maybe it's the way his character is written, it's the right kind of humor. I think here's why. Here's why. It's because his character is the dumb, one of the dumb ones, right? And so if he tells a funny joke at the expense of the smart ones and it's actually funny, it feels like a more even-handed movie. So it feels like a bit of a more of a fairness joke. I actually am a huge Jennifer Lawrence fan, by the way. I'm a big okay. Jennifer Lawrence fan. So it's my, that's probably my, yeah, probably my, my, my favorite, like, young actress like like uh, upcoming actress i guess she's been around for a while now but like i, I well established yeah she's well established I, I i go back to like when she started with the hunger games and stuff like that or when yeah, she's i think that's 10 years ago now right oh my god you're right yes yeah, 10 years ago all right so so as my one of my favorite established actresses uh, uh jennifer lawrence <laughs> um she uh um yeah so i so i love all the a lot of the actors in the movie but i think that the reason that that joke works like when he's like dunking on jennifer lawrence it's because it feels more fair because yeah, uh, Jonah Hill's a dummy, but he's also funny. So mm -hmm. it feels like a more of a fleshed out character than a bunch of smart people dunking on dumb people. So, okay. Don't look up as a Netflix movie. Yep. Is there, any, is there anything on Netflix that maybe one day you might join Chappelle and I on nothing but oh. Netflix? So I think yeah. that's something yeah, what, 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 uh, yeah. There's a lot of stuff on there. There's a huge variety. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, they, I know they dropped the mole seasons three and four recently, mm -hmm. which are not my favorite. Moles, Celebrity, but, uh, yeah. Celebrities. Uh, what, 
you don't have to th- commit to anything. Yeah. Just just yeah. Uh, keep it uh, keep it open. Yeah, keep. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll keep in mind something. I, I know we had talked a little bit about for all mankind at one point. I so think it was on, like Apple Plus or something. I, but or, I know, and you haven't you haven't looked at it yet, right? Yeah, yeah. I don't I don't have Apple TV. I haven't taken that plunge yet. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I would you know I, that I I'd, I'd pay for your subscription to hear uh, what you have to say about the show. Oh, okay. Because, okay. Uh, that it is. Uh, I, I think I think you'd really enjoy it and from what you've told me about also emily being interested in the space program yeah i think i i just think it's uh you know like uh you don't have to like knock it all out but i definitely would love to hear your thoughts when you start on that journey well i need to trade subscriptions out i need to to cancel disney plus i've seen all the things i want to see on disney plus now so i I, i'm gonna go trade over i'm certain i'm starting to feel the subscription creep so I need to start like I, I, I need so like the, what the bean counters at the companies are planning on that I just don't cancel the subscriptions. I need yeah. to start canceling them and then then, then going then what's going to be the first I, to go? Well, I, I think right now Disney Plus just because there's nothing really gripping me at the moment. I saw the Beatles documentary, um, and I, I think that's all I really needed. I don't need more Star Wars. I'm okay. I, I'm gonna take a Star Wars break for a while. I feel so. I yeah. Hear well, you know, like you things. are are so like uh, I I have so much respect for you because uh, that you know when to say when. Because I had talked to you about uh, mm-hmm. season two of Picard, and I said, yeah. uh, you know, it was it was interesting. And you said, you know what? I'm I'm happy with the Star Trek I already have. Mm-hmm. I don't need I don't I don't need to see more from Picard. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, that's that's my feeling about it. I mean, and uh, and it's the kind of thing that if I if I hear down the road that like a couple years from now I hear people saying, "Man, Picard season two was so awesome, you got to go back and see it." Then maybe I'll consider it, but I don't need to go and rush to it at a given time. So I can mm-hmm. I can sort of filter out like the ebbs and flows. So I I'm I, I'm coming to terms with it. Now that said, I think where it's coming to bite me now is I'm I'm also now scared to adopt new shows. Oh. Uh, I've been burned enough times. I mean, so like I, I I'm daring to dream with Better Call Saul. I am watching The Boys. Uh, yes, the, the, the Boys. I it's a lot. Mm-hmm. But I'm intrigued. <laughs> yes. uh, it, okay. it's, uh, you recommend it? I a, a cautioned recommendation. It I, I I know I saw I saw Dave Davy talking about it. How it's a it's a like there's some scenes that you didn't think would be allowed on TV if it were on TV, and it's and uh, it triggers a lot of things I don't like to watch on TV shows, and yet I'm still watching it. I think that says something. So mm-hmm. those who don't know the boys is about like quote unquote real life superheroes. Yes, like, yes. If, like if the, if the justice league was real and mm-hmm. in a somewhat cynical world, and it's a, it's an interesting kind of science fiction uh, universe that they set up with some, I got to say, I'm more impressed than I thought I'd be with the satire they're going for. It's, it's, a, it's kind of a dark, it's dark drama slash dark comedy satire. And I keep watching it, even though it does, a lot of things I I cannot watch in shows. Uh, mm-hmm. Like I, like I I have a hard time with this, follow me follow me here. Yeah. Uh, sorry, uh, I have a hard time watching vampire movies because um, I'm scared at any point in time a vampire will bite someone, like just out of nowhere, just mm-hmm. it'll just happen, and I can't yeah. I cannot stand that sort of jump scare or tension of that kind of jump scare. I don't like that psychological tension. Yes, that kind of tension. No. The superheroes and the boys are so devastatingly powerful that they could rip someone in half at any point in time and maybe will. And so it's that same feeling of me watching a vampire movie. I have a hard time watching the boys, and yet I still am watching it. I, I, I Now, I pause it. I leave the room a lot of the times, and I come back and like maybe – check ahead to see if anyone got is, half, is emily there is she telling you what happened or are you just listening no, at that point this was yeah. a, that one that one's a me only one that's the one i'll put on my headphones i'll listen to by myself and i'll take off my headphones yeah just, and when you just get the sense like someone is gonna die and it's not gonna be pretty and then i come back later just because the world building is pretty interesting mm-hmm. so anyway okay. that's well christian uh you've done it once again oh um you. you know uh that i you know I feel like that, you know, we we could go uh, on and on and on, um, but I, I just hope you'll come back and we can do it again. 
Oh, I think we have plenty more to talk about, Rob. I, yes. I, uh, so uh, I appreciate it. Uh, every time I, we, we, we have the opportunity to find each other. This is, this is always, it's always a treat. Yeah. Um, and the pleasure is mine. Uh, what could you tell people to go and check out? Is there, is there anything that people could uh, go and, and do or, or look at that you have coming up? So, uh, yeah. So, I mean, in general, you can, so if you want to find me on social media, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Chubiki, C-H-U-B-I-C-K-I, Chewbacca's younger brother. You can also find me on twitch.tv at Chubiki as well, where maybe without warning, all of a sudden I'll pop on, maybe give a lecture, maybe talk, maybe do some coding tutorials. I actually mm -hmm. did a coding tutorial where we all coded up the, where we all coded up the, um, the Monty Hall problem, the famous yes. do or die twist. A Monty thousand Hall problem. times. Yes. We were, and then we coded, we coded it up. So it would run it a thousand times because I kept getting people telling me, I don't like Christian. I don't believe you that it's smarter to switch. I don't believe you. Yeah. Including, uh, you know, even Stephen Fishback was getting a little snippy about it at one point, but I, I forgive him. And, uh, and so, and so I ran it a thousand times to show like how, and, and we coded it from scratch. Like I've actually, in fact, the reason I did this, Rob, is because one time on when this in season forty one when this cropped up, I talked. To, I I it, I love it and I hate it, Rob, because every time the Monty Hall problem comes up, yeah, people don't believe it, and that's okay. It's crazy, and I have to. And and, and the people at, and now people at me mm -hmm. about it. Yeah, I feel compelled to respond. Yes, and that entire next day, I'm replying to people on Twitter arguing about various parts of the Monty Hall or High Hall problem, and I eventually say, Hey, look try it out here here's someone wrote wrote a web page so you can try it out a thousand times like millions yeah. of times and someone replied to me and said yeah but how do we not not know that they're cheating and then and, and cheating on the, and, and the code just to just to, to appease the monty hall uh the, the monty hall conspiracy people mm -hmm. who believe that this is a real thing right like, okay done i am going to code it in front of you in fact so we did it on twitch get TV. out the ti-83 yes what we did is we we, was we coded it in, a, in a programming language called python it's a very easy language to pick up and i explained it from scratch and we coded online so you don't need any special software if you have access to the internet we coded from scratch a monty python's monty python which is a Monty Monty Hall simulator in Python, so that's pretty hilarious. Yeah. Um. As and uh and, and we run it many 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 times, and so uh that's still up on Twitch.tv if you want to follow along. I uh, and sometimes I pop on there, so feel free to follow and uh and you can just if you want to find me in other venues, go to ChristianUbicky.com and you know I give public talks and uh uh you know and I I just gave one actually yesterday, Rob, and that was a fun time. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Well, Christian, uh, this was uh. A Incredible job by you. Uh, lots of great information, of course. Uh, let Christian know how much uh, you enjoyed this if you're one of the people that's still listening. And uh, thank you so much for checking this out. Uh, we've got a lot more fun stuff coming your way as we start to get ready for Big Brother coming up. Uh, I know uh, Christian will be tuning in. Got to see, uh, expect the unexpected. I hear Fessy is coming back. It's my favorite. <laughs> is, that, is, that, is that right? That's what I heard. Is there a Fessy? That, that, <laughs> that is a person. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Robinswebsite.com slash subscribe to make sure you're getting everything that we are doing over on RHAP. Take care, everybody. Have a good one. Bye.